Tere hommikust, rõõm näha. Good morning everybody and I'm very happy to see you and greet you here in Kurasara and Taltek Kurasara College also welcomes you. When we organized this, started to organize this event and then we discussed that if the audience is full of people uh, it's, it's, it's a very good sign, but if there are a few empty seats, then there's still room for growth and development, and obviously this is the case. Today we are going to discuss new topics. It's a vision seminar. So we think about this room for development and growth. People who will be taking the floor today have been concerned about these uh, issues and uh, setting up the college um, for, for years already. And today we are um, going to explore new areas. I will be the moderator of the day. My name is Willow Watzfeld. And I'm also very pleased to see, uh, to greet the representative of the Estonian government here, Mr. Maris Kallas. He has been the head of local government for quite a long time, also in Saarema, uh, the Ministry of the Environment today, and also the rector of um, Tallinn University of Technology, Mr. Diet Lund, will be here and taking the floor. We have set up the day in two blocks. The first is more politically uh, driven, perhaps, and the second part is driven more by Tech and we talk about ways to move forward. This will not be the last event uh, uh, on these matters. We hope that these topics gain more importance, they become more international. So this is the first of many meetings on these topics. So once again, I'm very happy to meet you and I now give the floor to the minister, Mr. Matis Kallas. It's an anxious day for the Estonian uh, central government for quite other re reasons. But without further ado, please, the floor is yours. And to everybody, enjoy the day. Thank you for these uh, words of introduction. Honourable participants, rector, dean, guests. As Willu Watzfeld already said, it's an interesting day for Estonia and I think it will become a landmark because we take an important step concerning uh, the topic of war memorials and especially considering the uh, Ukrainian war context. Um, it's still early in the day, but I can already pass on the greetings from the Prime Minister. This morning we had a cabinet meeting in the Stenbock building in Tallinn, but I was able to catch the plane to be here so Estonia is a, is a small country in a way, but um, a big country in some other ways. The topic that is um, in the focus today is very important to me. I have been the ministry for, Minister for the Environment and a member of the government for four weeks only, but what is very close to my heart are regional topics and also those topics that don't perhaps touch people living in Tallinn, but um, elsewhere in Estonia too. Today, uh, the capital region, region around Tallinn, is growing very quickly. We also know the population balance in different regions in Estonia. In some areas, you have to build new schools, kindergartens, because there are so many children <laughs> who need these places, but in other areas you have to shut the kindergartens and schools down because people move away. And for me, uh, and especially in Saarema, schools and other 
country schools are very important. It's uh, of utmost essence that we would have these developments in smaller regions as well. Looking back in time, let's say 30 years, uh, the situation was different in Estonia, also what concerns schools and kindergartens, but young people are the foundation of life in, in every geographical area. And if we go even further back in time, then people living in coastal areas, also in Saarema, their life and work has always been related to seafaring, fishing and all other blue economy areas. So even if the essence of this has changed, it doesn't mean that in certain areas we shouldn't get more jobs and uh, more jobs from blue economy and uh, would have more people uh, living in coastal areas. Today I am here as the government representative first and foremost and looking at the topic of the day, smart sea, although So the um, title Smart Sea made me think about um, a few other uh, keywords and I would like the Ministry of the Environment to be responsible for this uh, area, this um, sector and also with everything that has to do with um, uh, nature con conservation and sustainability. So all the things that have to do with uh, sea and environment. Now, looking at how the protection topics that concern the sea and other areas have been doing over the most recent years, uh, things have improved, uh, sewage is not uh, guided to the sea directly, it's been cleaned, landfills either closer or further away from uh, the coast is not something that we can see anymore. It's a taboo that people don't want to see anymore. But in a bigger picture, uh, the situation of the Baltic Sea is not good and we need decisions. Estonia has to take certain decisions but also other countries have to do it. People who live here and those who live elsewhere, they take good care of the nature, the environment and that includes uh, the sea. And Sarema and I as the, as the minister uh, find that nature conservation areas cannot be expanded into the areas that have regional importance. So what does it mean? Yes, we can set up new nature conservation uh, rules, parks areas, but not in regional um, area or in not in regions where uh, there's lack of people living there. So by that I mean for example the capital region around Tallinn and Harjoma but it shouldn't be so in other areas where there is no problems related to nature conservation, however, where we have a lack of people and lack of jobs. So we don't need any more restrictions uh, there. So people do appreciate uh, the nature and want to protect the environment. It also concerns coastal areas, uh, forests, groundwater, the way we protect it. Uh, we already know what we have to do for protecting it and we have been able to prove it over the past three decades. What's also important is cooperation between various parties and the representative of the ministry will focus on that even more later on today. As I already mentioned, the Ministry for the Environment could be uh, the body mm, who takes the lead in blue economy topics and who would engage other ministries 
we already know that everything that has to do with fishing and uh, uh, pollution or sea water pro marine protection this is the responsibility of the Ministry of Finance but also Uh, but also the ministry responsible for regional development. So my idea would be to bring all these topics together because it's the natural resources that we want to use and also protect. What I've also said before and repeat again is that all kinds of slogans that what should be done or not done by 2040, 2060, these are very nice. But if we really want to make a change, we have to act now. We don't have 10 years or 20 years to waste. We have to look around and think about what can we do within the next two years, within the next four years. And what pushes us to do it is that we want to keep people living in the countryside so that we wouldn't be only protecting uh, the natural environment without any one living there, any people living there. And I believe that today's conference also has an important role in that, looking into the future, um, the next four years, but also further on. So thinking about what can we do now and what would the impact of our actions today be in 10 or 20 years. Because if we try to look into the future, uh, let's say for 20 years from today, it's um, probably just nice words that might not bring any tangible results. And what makes me say that? For example, wind energy. We know that these developments over the past 15 years in Estonia, they have been very topical, but we don't have, we haven't built almost any new wind farms in Estonia over the past 15 years. And this is also true for offshore wind farms. And hopefully they pick up speed soon. What also concerns Sarama is that the blue economy would be efficient in all areas. Uh, so in other words, it should be green. So the rector has also emphasized that. So the blue-green economy would be uh, uh, a brilliant goal for us. And I hope that we all can contribute to that. I thank everybody who participates in today's conference. Uh, there's people here who have been focused on uh, renewable energy topics, um, green, environmental and blue economy topics. And just recently we had an event, Opinion Festival, uh, that took place and uh, it was also discussed that local governments and municipalities should be more engaged in uh, national or state level or yes, national politics and I believe that um, a good example here is the wind energy again because in Western Estonia uh, the debates around uh, wind farms and using wind energy has been have been very very active so many thanks to you all I believe that we have to uh, protect and preserve Estonian natural environment and this is also true today even though we have other crises going on in Estonia in Narva region for example but uh, in a wider context uh, the, uh, concerning Ukraine and also Covid pandemics etc all the other uh, crises but thank you and all the best I take the liberty to decide that we go through the first block and then before the coffee break we have some time reserved for questions. These are big topics we are going to discuss today, are uh, important, uh, it varies a lot and the ministries that you listed that are involved in these topics as well, uh, it was long but not uh, all-inclusive, I believe that other ministries are 
also uh, in, engaged in one way or another. And the rector of Tallinn University of Technology, Ms. Tietland, the floor is yours. Thank you, and of course we'll accept any challenge that's posed to us. Other, if we don't, then we have no future ahead of us. Uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you, Minister. I'm really happy on behalf of Taltec to in, to host you here in Kurasara. Usually, it has been. Uh, Minister Kallas, who has welcomed me on the island, uh, he used to be the municipal mayor here. So I'm really happy to be uh, his host at, on Sarema Island today uh, here. Uh, Taltec, as you know, is one of the six public universities in Estonia. Uh, the world tech technology tells us that we are the only technological university. We have a state-imposed mandate through administrative agreement to ensure uh, the future generations of engineers and technology specialists for Estonia. We are quite a large university. We have about 2,000 employees uh, today, about 10,000 students and nearly 70,000 uh, live, I'm sorry for the expression, live alumni. Uh, this is quite a big volume of people and I'm sure some of you in this room today are our alumni as well. I wouldn't want to talk about money too much uh, today, but I have to mention this topic, um, and I will come back to the issue of budget later. But our annual budget is uh, about 121 million euros. I'm mentioning this uh, right now because less of 50 percent of it, 55 million, is the so-called stable, stable financing that we receive from the state through the Ministry of Education and Research primarily for teaching and research. And uh, in addition, there are competitive grants uh, from uh, Estonian Research Agency. And the second 50%, the other half of our budget, has been brought to us by our people. And this is to underscore the fact that we are a very entrepreneurial university. We have many partners in companies, and our budget is a good reflection of that. I'm saying this also um, specifically today because we are here to uh, talk together with you to uh, what to formulate our visions together for Kurasara College, uh, not only for Sarma Island and the college specifically, but for Estonia in the future. Uh, the college is not a separate entity. It's part of our school of engineering. Our school of engineering is not a, a uni per se. It's part of Taltec. Taltec is part of Estonia servicing the needs and interests of uh, Estonia as a nation. And Estonia, once again, does not stand alone, but we are a part of a uh, global ecosystem. And today we have Tiet Jurima from the European Commission. Uh, please uh, correct me uh, on your title, but I believe that you are from the uh, DG of uh, Research and Innovation. Uh, so Taltec, uh, also it's although it is the Tallinn University of Technology, it's not only based in Tallinn. Uh, it is present in every corner of Estonia. Uh, I live in Vuru. We don't have a college there, but we have a college at Tartu, 70 kilometers from us. Uh, we have a college in Ida Viruma in Kohtlajärve, and then we have the Kurasara College. Um, Kurasala College has went through different developments, as we all have, and we are right now, let's say, hoping for or envisioning a new stage in its development. Uh, Kurasala College 
um, under this particular name, once again, uh, has been operational since May 2021. Uh, the decision of the Senate uh, from last May reorganized uh, the Kuresare Center of Taltec, which at that point was part of the Estonian Maritime Academy, and to reorganize it into uh, Kuresare. Uh, college and over this one year we have seen a lot of changes. I myself feel as if I'm uh, an islander myself. It's been my, I think, sixth time here this year. I've vis visited the island practically every month this year and over this year I've seen that the college has uh, gathered sort of a vision or a will to create something new and something better. The blue economy that we are speaking about today is a new direction uh, for us, for our college. This is the result of this kind of crystallization process that has going on in our thoughts. Uh, I won't repeat what the minister said about uh, the green transition and the blue-green economy. Um, as far as I know, Taltec is uh, the only university in Estonia that I know of that has a uh, green transition project on the very highest level. Uh, Helen is the manager. She's right here in the room. And uh, coming back to the budget, a political uh, let's say footnote. Uh, the government is fully aware of it, and the coalition has even admitted that uh, higher education financing uh, has uh, is in deep stagnation. But uh, yeah, as I said, I mean money is one of the problems. Uh, there's never enough of it. But the second problem or the second challenge is, as the minister put it, cooperation. How? Can we make use of the money that we have uh, as well as possible, as efficiently as possible, uh, and to benefit from all of it? And this is um, work to be done in cooperation. And of course, the college has a role here as a regional college to cooperate with a municipality, to cooperate with local companies to cooperate with the community. So without all of this, our culture, our college wouldn't have the function uh, it was created for. A blue economy in the context of uh, Saarema and Kurasare uh, is uh, clearly important. Uh, Saarema is a very entrepreneurial community, just like our university is a very entrepreneurial um, university, and I can see a great focus for cooperation with local companies. I can see a great need to cooperate better between universities as well. I'm very happy to see representatives of uh, Tartu University Pärnu College and the Estonian University of Life Sciences uh, is also involved in these areas of research, so it is not our aim to do something on our own. It's always our aim to cooperate. And uh, once again, I can assure you that uh, on uh, the top management level, Taltec believes Kuresara College's development is of great value. We are here to cooperate. We're very happy to see here today uh, people uh, from the Strategy Bureau of the University, for example. We have people here today from our research department. We have uh, dedicated grant writers at our disposal uh, who can uh, offer support to the college uh, for large grant applications on the European Commission level and other international organizations level. So we are here to do all of this together. We are here to stay and we are here to be as effective and efficient as possible and as uh, Mighty said uh, to be uh, to pr work for a green blue economy. So thank you. I'm looking forward to your great ideas today and thank you for all the presenters who have been 
uh, who have made themselves available from us, for example, arriving from Brussels. Thank you. I think we had a very good start and we saw how two things were linked very nicely. Uh, the minister spoke about resources and the college, uh, Kurasara College, brought us to the idea of how research has developed um, in the direction of finding out how to use the resources in the best possible way. Now, the question is about re uh, regenerating, finding new resources to give something back to the environment so that engineering and the environment would function well together. And Fyodor Sergeyev, uh, the floor is yours from uh, the University of technology. Good morning, colleagues, representatives of the ministry, um, local community, uh, the college, family, guests. We are meeting here today in a seminar that is called uh, smart C and we will be talking about our plan to set up the blue economy uh, center in the, on the island of Sarama and as we've always emphasized we need smart approach smart technologies and that means means um, science and research. As a representative of the engineering department, I stand here uh, in front of you to talk about what we in our department want to do in Sarama, in Kurasara College. Now, before I start talking about the development plans of our college, I look back and um, I remind you too that it was the 1st of June last year when Kurasara College was re-established. So we have had a very good start to our work. We have set very ambitious goals and objectives and we can already show results. I will come back to this later on. And um, what's more, according to the statutes of Taltec, the colleges they have equal to institutes that they have. So they belong to a bigger structural unit and this is the engineering department for Kurasara College. And the other thing uh, that is important is that the college first and foremost focuses on providing education, although it's also true that all Taltec colleges are active in research and development. And we've done it so far, but in another area. And third, I remind you that the decision taken by the Senate of the university, uh, it meant that uh, all structural units or colleges that are located outside the campus in, in Tallinn so, as the rector already said, we have one college in uh, East, East Estonia, in Kotlerve, uh, one in Southern Estonia, in Tartu, and one here in Saarema. So, all these colleges are under the engineering department, which means that all these colleges are linked to technology and engineering. Two of the colleges are of regional importance, 
uh, namely the um, East Estonia and Saaremaa Kuresare College. And all three colleges focus on specific topics, and this depends on the local situation and the competencies that are available in these particular regions. For example, uh, the one in um, East, Eastern Estonia is um, closely linked to oil shale technologies, but not only that. And um, they have ran very successfully for years now the Oil Shale Competence Center. And this center provides services for the public sector as well as companies. Um, and uh, they f these services focus on oil shale and, and chemistry, but also the, the green uh, transition. But we will be reviewing the um, uh, strategy for Gotlerve uh, uh, College um, in the near future. In Kurasare College, we have the small craft competence center set up and they focus on uh, shipbuilding, um, design and uh, modeling and model testing services and also marine materials uh, development and innovation and that has been done on this island for quite uh, many years and quite successfully already. The college in Tartu have competencies in construction area, first and foremost, but also um, telematics, for example, and smart systems, uh, not to forget um, industrial ecology. And the reason I mention these things is that for Tartu College, the construction and telematics areas that are mostly related to um, education, learning. So they work together with uh, Tallinn, or structural units in Tallinn. So it means that the students uh, study together. And for telematics and smart systems, they work together with the uh, Kohtlajärve uh, College. Why I mention this? It's because we have a large department, and the rector already mentioned financing and money, so I can't overlook it. And I must say that the engineering department is the biggest in Taltec. And when we talk about money, then it's about one third of the entire budget of the university for R&D. Uh, we make up 40% of the university. and. As the rector described, state funding makes up only about 50% of our money that we can use. Uh, it means that the engineering department is capable of bringing in quite a lot of money and, and, and raise funds uh, quite successfully. Uh, we make sometimes in some years we make 60 or even 70 percent of the uh, money uh, or we bring in uh, external money so we could have more resources but we do have resources already as well and it all boils down to smart thinking and to how to be more effective and use to be these uh, resources effectively so today we sit inside in this room. It's 30 degrees outside, sunny day. And uh, this is a result of human activity on this planet. So as the climate is getting warmer, but perhaps also for other reasons, we have to develop all areas in a sustainable way and if necessary we have to come up with new more efficient 
and smart uh, solutions and technologies. We have to be environmentally friendly, we have to use circular approaches, and we have to take the maximum of all uh, res or we ha have to add maximum value to all the resources that we use. And this is why, in, ad in addition to small crafts or shipbuilding, when we talk about Kurasara College and its plans, then in addition to these things, and by the way, shipbuilding has been the uh, sector uh, that has generated most uh, income in Sarema. Uh, we believe that Sarema's economy should be more closely linked to blue economy. It's inevitable. We cannot overlook it. So we uh, should be bringing in new technologies and introduce them to Estonia. It was already mentioned today as well that whether we talk about blue economy or green economy, should the blue economy be more greener? Uh, yes, it's a very new concept, a new direction for us all. And um, there's great potential, potential in developing uh, blue economy. And I yet emphasize the efficiency and sustainability. But it's also true that since these um, concepts are so new, we don't have long-term structures to rely on. We don't have relevant practice or le legislation in Estonia. So we have to start from scratch. It's difficult in the beginning, I'm sure. But it's not impossible. As we know, all good things started with a thought, with an idea, and the idea is what we already have, but now we also have to act. Uh, the Competence Center on Blue Economy is meant for laying a foundation for establishing a, a cluster of blue economy, so in other words, a community a community that would collaborate with companies, offer services that are necessary in terms of R&D, but also studies. Soon we'll, we will hear about the more precise plans, but for example, lab services is, is a key part of the activities that we are planning here. It's also true that getting such a cluster up and running takes a lot of work in the beginning of the process. But I'm convinced that we have the will and we have the capacity to do it. Why? Why am I so certain? Well, we can look at what's been done already. I have been on Sarama for two weeks already, and last week we had in the college premises and also here in Tulekota an event. Here we had um, Night Academy event, and it was Czerny Baltic Summer School. And this event also took place in the college. CERN, CERN, is a very research-based structure and community. And we found, because Taltec and the engineering department also um, has plans that are linked to CERN, we found that the summer school could be organized in Sarema, not only because it's such a wonderful place with sea and lots of fresh air and kind people, but also because uh, the community, the people here are very uh, interested in research. And I sensed this very strongly during the Night Academy event. 
where we had about 80 people attending. Uh, everybody was listening carefully to all the presentations. And the presentations covered all possible areas, starting from uh, medicines, genetics, uh, geology, material sciences, uh, nuclear science, nuclear energy. about black holes, all these things were discussed during the Knight Academy, but people showed a lot of interest in science, research and technology. And this is why I sincerely believe that the community in Sarema wants to see these changes, uh, the commu community wants to contribute to new developments and be a part of them, and also to develop their own community. Uh, the council or the board of the college took a decision on 24th of March to change their structure. And in addition to the uh, ship and marine structures to set up uh, the competence center on blue economy, but there are also other uh, areas that are covered computational fluid dynamics, for example, engineering, um, experience economy, and so on and so forth. But what it really shows is that the college has taken the first step. They are we are moving forward officially now. The competence center on blue economy has been set up. We work with the Baltic Sea and the college here will, in all its strategies, focus on being sustainable, work in a way that all these different areas support one another, feed into one another, and that they take into account the interests of the local community. I, as the Dean of the Engineering Department, support all the activities of the Corusara College. I support the technological advancements and I stand for taking engineering forward in entire Estonia. And therefore, all our resources, either financial or human resources that we have, we try to and uh, we will do our best to use them in an efficient way so that we could grow and develop quickly and in in some areas set um, set a role model for other countries not only in Europe but also across the world like we do it uh, in Kotlaerva uh, regarding um, fair transition, we can also do it in Sarema. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sergeyev. And as a representative of the community, I can add that, uh, for example, uh, when we speak about the wind parks that the minister mentioned, or we see aquaculture people in the room, so uh, a lot of uh, those areas uh, or delays in those developments have been related to the fact that although we have been living in the middle of the sea for centuries, we have no, we don't have a complete understanding of what is happening. Uh, however, it is clear that community is expecting and community is also uh, facing a crossroads because everybody knows that there are a lot of trends going on globally. On the one hand, we want uh, uh, everything that is technological, modern and sustainable, but we don't want it in our backyard. And this is typical of Sare, Mahiu, Mamuhu, any island, actually. And this is perhaps one of the challenges that perhaps uh, the college uh, 
center of competence uh, can study how to enable modern uh, developments with great perspective while sustaining our current environment that we all value. So what will be happening with the college? Merit Kinsiko, the director of the college, uh, will be one of our key speakers today. And we will present you a plan that is quite long and comprehensive. But as the minister affirmed, we have to take decisions right now. There is no point in making a five-year plan. We have to make a 15-year plan and the other plans develop along the way towards the big goal. So Merit, you have the floor. Hello. I was just thinking that uh, I only have the beautiful images, but now you can see them. Once upon a time, there was an island in the middle of the sea, a pretty, clean, small, surrounded by pristine sea, fishes jumping, bees and birds flying around, people living on the island. They enjoyed living there. The island was very clean. People accepted what the nature gave them. If there was fish, they could eat it. If there wasn't, they gathered berries. The life was nice and natural. Don't you think so? And it's not a fairy tale. This is our history. Up until a certain day, when development started, the development of industry. In the other words, the first industrial revolution in 1760. What happened? People wanted to get more, get it faster, sell it, earn profits. And where has this led us to? So this is where we are today. In a mere 250 years, we have managed to um, consume more than the nature has had to give. In the Baltic Sea, we have reached the, the upper ceiling of fishing. We have tons of plastic going into the global oceans. We have 200,000 tons of radioactive nu nuclear waste that has been dumped into the sea. About 50 years ago, about 300,000 tons of uh, oil and crude oil leaked into the sea per year. So. We, as humans, are polluting the nature faster with nutrients than the nature can adopt. We have a lot of algae, but since certain fish stocks have been depleted, there is nobody to eat them. As humans, we cannot exploit those algae yet to solve the problem. And invasive species, stronger species have taken over the nature, the balance, has changed. This is where we are today. This has happened over 250 years. So where, why are we here today? Because of what we saw in the previous slide. We as humans have managed to consume more than we have managed to preserve. The world is undergoing such a rapid process of, how should I call it, um, um, doom? Perhaps not that morbidly, but thanks to human activity, we have reached a point where we are witnessing processes in the world that 
we as humans can no longer control or stop. Yesterday I read a very good sentence. If you have everything under the control, you're not moving along fast enough. This is what the humankind has done very well. We are progressing this fast in our consumption uh, that we no longer can control it. Unfortunately, we only have one planet to live on. We as humans are not as adaptable as many other species. We cannot live on other planets. That is why we only have one planet and this planet should be inhabitable for the generations to come as well. Unfortunately, the processes are so large and so global that it is not enough when one group of people or one university or one state takes action. We need a larger scale. And what's even worse, it's not enough for marine biologists to come and say there is no cod anymore, let's do something. Can we can those biologists do something to restore the cod population, regardless of what everybody else is doing around them? No, the fisherman is going to come back with a trawler and fish the cord out even if uh, marine biologists or aquaculturists can restore some of the species. Okay, let's agree not to fish the cord. That's the two of us, the fishermen and the biologists. We are going to be good, we are going to restore the population. But then we have a plant next to the sea that wants to produce something and I don't really care about wastewater or perhaps there's a farmer who says that I want to grow cattle, I want to preserve our uh, coastal meadows and I need to use tractors. So nobody can do anything alone. It is a huge challenge to solve global problems, and that is why we need to join forces. We need to join forces between scientists in different fields of research. We all have to invest our uh, knowledge, uh, time, money to find working solutions. We have been on the speed train of these processes for quite some time, but we have not found any solutions. Otherwise, we would have been able to slow down the processes. And this kind of cross-border, cross-sectoral cooperation, in my humble opinion, will be the future of our life. We cannot divide ourselves into engineers, physicists, biologists, social scientists anymore. We, can ju we have to combine our forces to look at these processes together. And that is why I am very happy to see that people at our university, in our university, are saying this as well. They have admitted that we have to look at the challenges ahead of us. We have to rethink our own values. And we all have to step out of our comfort zones and silos to work together. Because it is our environment that we are consuming. These are our resources that we are consuming. But we have to uh, acknowledge that this environment and these resources inspire us, but they also limit us. We cannot afford limitless consumption. When we're speaking about the vision of Kulasara College and its philosophy, I'd rather use the second word, then together with my team, we have reached a common understanding. Our vision 
is that no human action can um, exceed the tolerance of the environment. Every action has to be targeted at improving the state of the environment. We cannot remain users. We have to contribute as well. But what is most complicated is defining the starting point. Whatever we want to do, we don't know what the exact impact to all stakeholders will be. And finding this, let's say, starting point, defining, identifying this, the starting point is uh, complicated. We have not find it, found it yet. I very much like the phrase, do no harm, in the EU Green Deal. And there's another phrase that um, I love. It's by uh, Ulof Ogleit, who has said that to become sp smart, you don't need to study, you have to think. Uh, we have defined green, blue, sorry, blue economy today re repeatedly already, but I'll just touch upon it briefly. Blue economy uh, encompasses all sectors or cross-sectoral activities which are based on or linked to global oceans, seas, and coasts. For example, fishing, um, aquaculture, um, renewable energies, desalination, transport, coastal tourism, but also indirectly uh, fish processing industries, biotechnology, shipbuilding, maintenance, for example, design of uh, floating vessel construction, uh, engineering, uh, smart pounds for aquaculture, smart autonomous vessels. All of this is part of the green economy. Uh, today, the EU uh, blue economy employs 4.5 people, million people directly. I'd say that's quite a lot. And then what is sustainable blue economy? Uh, briefly, it is development that satisfies the needs and pursuits of the current generation without endangering the interests of the future generations. When we speak about consumption of resources, then by now everybody has understood that we can consume very well. How many of us can contribute to the environment? Who has contributed anything lately? For example, has anyone planted a tree lately? Have you contributed to a restoration of a natural ecosystem? Have you modeled an important model, invented anything? There are many options. We don't have to do this physically in the nature. We can do it otherwise as well through research, through development, through mapping, modeling, inventions, innovations. Not everything has to be physical. Th this is perhaps one of the static points that we have moved beyond uh, focusing on the physical. People have not learned to consume sustainably for Hundreds and thousands of years, we have had repeated examples of this. Already in 867, when the first Vikings came to Estonia and started to uh, hunt uh, local sea animals, they uh, destroyed the population in about 30 years, uh, walruses. Uh, some few hundred years later, this happened uh, to whales in Iceland. When the EU, uh, a few hundred years, 
uh, in 30 years when Norwegian uh, whale hunters went to Iceland because the local stocks uh, had been depleted, they destroyed the local population in th about 30 years. I think they started out thinking, let's not over hunt. money is enticing so i think that the european commission has uh, concluded uh, very well on what is sustainable blue economy it's putting the blue into the green or the green into the blue. But why is sustainability important? We understand that the resources are running out. We need to contribute. I have looked at the green seal and extracted a few of the priorities. For example, uh, protection and restoration of ecosystems and biological diversity, reduction of pollution in air, in water, on the land, deployment of circular economy principles, uh, improvement of waste management, uh, ensuring sustainable blue economy. This is specifically what we are intending to focus on here in Kurasara. At the same time, the EU and the world in general has taken on a lot of obligations, tasks, uh, challenges um, concerning uh, how to mitigate global warming. And in order to achieve those objectives, it is important to invest massively as we have heard from the university and as we heard from the ministry, we need a lot of money. Um, in order to achieve the EU targets, or we are talking about amounts whereby one or two countries are no longer, is not no longer enough. EU on its own is no longer enough, but that's where we live. So what can we do? We cannot contribute financially, but we can contribute with our time, our energy, our competence. And that is why I can conclude that to achieve climate neutrality, we have to act long term for any large change demands a generation worth of work in the world. And as Minister Matis Kallas already said, the decisions are late already. The decisions should have been made. The action should be in process today. We can no longer uh, afford to discuss and hold seminars. We need to take action. In the seas, uh, we, for example, have a tight link between biological diversity fishing and vessels. But for something to happen, we need to protect our resources. Marine protected areas, including natura areas, do exist nowadays. However, they are not enough. Uh, we have made calculations. Every euro invested in marine protected areas uh, will bring back three euros. It's a promising calculation, but this money is not enough either. We need to add additional value, and we also don't have enough marine protected areas. We cannot sustain uh, necessary amount of good quality areas in the sea. We need to protect wider areas in our seas and we need to protect them more effectively. 
Speaking specifically about the Baltic Sea, it is a relatively young sea. And why are we speaking about the Baltic Sea? Because we are living in it, literally. Uh, it has been uh, named as a particularly sensitive sea area and its natural state started to worsen um, rapidly about a hundred years ago. Uh, shipping is very intensive on this sea and the situation started to degrade already before the Second World War and by today the situation is lousy. For example, we have dead or hypoxic zones in the sea. If you don't know what they are, these are zones on the sea floor where there is either no oxygen or very few of it. Uh, practically nobody can live there, no fish. And there are very few species that have adapted to life in anoxic or hypoxic uh, areas. During the last hundred years, uh, the area has increased tenfold. And if we look at shorter term com comparisons, then these areas are rapidly spreading. They are not decreasing. They are being mapped, we are aware of them, and we are just acknowledging the fact. The situation is bad. What can we do to reduce those areas to turn this process around? Nowhere in the world has anyone been able to reduce anoxic or hypoxic zones in the seas. Why are we thinking about these things on Sarem Island? Because, as our rector said, uh, we have a college of the only Estonian University of Technology here. I would like to add on what our dean said. The function and role of a regional college is not only to teach, of course, but also to do research and development. And on my behalf, I'd like to add and underline that we have to serve the local community and the society at large. We need to bring together science and uh, business in this region, science and companies, and then based on the regional spe specialties, uh, we can decide on what the focus is. Uh, what is our geographical location? We are an island in the middle of the sea. What should we think about but the sea? It is important for us logistically, it's important for us uh, from food perspective, from income perspective. It is very important for us on the island. For people on the continent, uh, uh, sea and coasts may mean holidays and interesting events. But for an islander, uh, this is our everyday. If there's a storm, is there a ship con connection? If uh, the sea is polluted, are there any fish? If there's a heat wave, there are blue algae everywhere and we can't swim. This is our everyday life. We have to live with it. And we do. Uh, historical and cultural um, heritage. Um, I took the right of calling it an inf uninfringible right of islanders. Sea and ships uh, have historically been linked to islands. You, we cannot, the continent doesn't have anything to do with it. 
And uh, lakes and rivers are very different to seas. I'd say they have different personalities. Every one of them has their own soul and their own nature. Our culture and our history have been enriched by the Vikings, as you know. It was uh, nice to uh, catch and farm fish uh, on the coast, uh, raise children. Every now and then Vikings came in and there was a lot of blood, but they left their heritage here. And that is why already historically um, Estonian in the Estonian West Islanders have always been a lot taller than uh, people on the continent. Uh, genetic research has confirmed Viking heritage in our genes. Uh, when it comes to geopolitical necessity, then um, we're talking about the likelihood of uh, sea wind parks. We're not discussing whether they will come. We're dis discussing uh, when they will come, and they should come quicker because we need energy, renewable energy, especially considering the geopolitical situation in the world. So speaking about uh, offshore wind farms, Sarama will be dealing with them in the future. We will be the closest located to them in Estonia. And our sea areas have quite a good perspective in this sense. Uh, research is ongoing, mapping is ongoing. Um, so perhaps uh, it might make sense uh, to uh, have, a, let's say, a focal point um, on this issue at our college. And we have practice. We have the sea, we have the fish, we have the waves, we have the coast. In the future, we will have the wind generators, we have the nets, uh, fishermen, people. Uh, the previous speakers have already stressed this, and I will stress it as well. Humans are one of our greatest resource. People are one of our greatest resource. They are what we value. And um, people's historical and cultural memory is of value as well. We cannot do anything without our own people inside the college as well as people living on the island and companies operating on the island and working here. So I think Sarama is the best and only location for studying blue economy. And this takes us to the 15 year vision. And the first thing here is that uh, the college team together with the university and the strategy team. Uh, we've brain brainstormed, we've um, analyzed the situation and done some mapping. And we've discovered that as the blue economy is a wide area, uh, we wouldn't be able to focus on absolutely everything. So we should pick a few that are more close to our heart and uh, that would be that would have a higher potential of us for us to make cooperation with others. As the dean already said, uh, it's a brand new area, brand new situation, and we have to start many things from scratch. But I would argue that the blue economy itself, as such, is not anything new. Seafaring, fishing, the sea itself, it's been there for centuries. But what's new is the aspect of sustainability, the sustainable use of resources, a research-based approach. These are the new ideas in blue economy. So we 
filled it out seven uh, areas and I will go into these uh, one by one later on but in addition to these areas which we will be developing according to the local needs, opportunities, uh, human resources, but also the interest shown by local um, community, uh, region, etc. Uh, and we will work together in taking these areas forward. We can't work with all seven at once. Um, I mean, the vision is for the next 15 years. So we take it step by step, and we will prioritize uh, along the way. Together with these areas and uh, directions that we have picked out, we also, in collaboration with uh, centers of competence, uh, offer various services for R&D activities, uh, lab services, we have project-based and active international cooperation too. We don't only talk about uh, Tallinn University of Technology, as I already said. We have cooperation with other Estonian universities, universities from abroad, uh, because it's, it's too big uh, a step to take uh, by yourself. So everybody brings on board their own competencies. And um, in our vision, we foresee that we will have topical conferences, uh, that we have a series of events. The uh, Knight Academy, for example, that the Dean mentioned was very popular. And uh, we also plan to have annual conferences, um, uh, for example, the Baltic Resilience Conference. And in addition to these seven areas, we also envision that we have um, that we would have three internationally recognized competence centers in the future. What they will be called, we don't know yet exactly, but we know what the what they will be working on. So one of them could be a marine industry center of our competence center and this is the small crafts competence center uh, at the moment uh, second uh, center of competence um, focuses on blue economy and the third uh, focuses on um, islands as i also already mentioned uh, labs uh, uh, sea rose, uh, resources and other areas now, depending on the opportunities uh, and the way that the competence centers will grow and develop, we plan to work together with uh, companies and to have projects together. It's easier to begin with uh, awareness raising and uh, training, but at one point you have to take it all to the labs, put the ideas to the test and start conducting research. Collaboration with other local uh, educational institutions is also something that we plan to do uh, here in Sarama, and we uh, wouldn't get too far without um, getting the local uh, government involved either. And as also the Dean already mentioned, college also sees itself as um, the leader of the Blue Economy Cluster here on Sarema. Uh, the first topic concerns uh, studies in uh, the Baltic Sea Islands and people in this uh, ecosystem. So it means uh, everything that has to do with islands, um, plans for islands, developments on islands, and this is, is a topic that perhaps um, is most further away from engineering, but not very far from blue economy, 
and not at all far from our region, the islands and the Baltic Sea. Because if we want to start approaching these uh, topics in a comprehensive way, it's very important to think about the human resources, social and economic factors and all kinds of impacts that might come into play due to this. Because whatever is happening around us is, to a large uh, degree, caused by people. And the future largely depends on people's decision, de decisions as well as actions. Uh, we do see need for analysis, uh, research projects, surveys. When we think about these various protected areas, but also tourism is um, something that has some um, human factor. I don't believe there would be tourism if it uh, wasn't for people. Uh, animals are rarely tourists. But people might venture into places on their own initiative where uh, animals live. Marine tourism and sea tourism is, is something a bit more new. I mean, on the land, we have all kinds of uh, tracks and um, uh, educational routes, but you can't really walk uh, around on sea. You, it's not that easy to go and have a look at the birds, some colonies, uh, fish, perhaps some geological sites. I mean, there's a huge difference whether you are standing on, on, the la on land and looking at sea or vice versa. And um, what I would also like to point out is that we focus on islands. Now, the second uh, topic was or is uh, the same as the title of today's event, Smart Sea. What does it mean? It's everything. Smart Sea could be everything. Anything that is smart, intelligent, that is based on technologies, um, its development, everything digital, electronic, more or less, has to do with smart and C. So we've added various um, examples, um, activity areas such as uh, uh, wind, waves, ports, uh, vessels, lifestyle pollution, etc. All the things that are topical and that we could work with. And how we succeed in this, uh, well, we will learn that over the next 15 years. Modeling data, this is also very important. It means that we bring together, gather information and data uh, that is already existing. And then we try to combine them in order to get a comprehensive view, because there are loads and loads of data. Everybody is doing some monitoring, gathering data, recording surveying, but we should bring all this together. We, our aim is to make it really comprehensive. So uh, the nature, the climate, all kinds of physical, biological processes uh, species, geologic, uh, geology, transport, everything artificial that can be found in sea, um, and everything that people have um, caused. Uh, what is happening with the rainwater that is pouring down, the water in the sea, um, the land around the sea, and so on. 
So this is quite a grand, grand plan, I would say. Obviously, we will divide it into smaller bits and pieces. And again, these bits and pieces will be something that have touched us, that uh, we find are relevant. I can't promise whether we will be working with all these key words mentioned here. It's a vision that we are talking about today. Um, the way it will go in real life, we will have to wait and see. Uh, next, digital twins, foresee smart and secure ports, uh, standardizing data, passport for smart sea, uh, smart uh, sea ways. Let's say you have a smartphone and it tells you where you are on the water, uh, whether there's any pollution, what kind of species live there, birds, fish anything uh, was looking at and various platforms was the last item here now the third topic is to adding value in a sustainable way to marine and coastal resources this is something that we definitely have to work on. We have to first and foremost um, start contributing into a strategy, uh, trying to find solutions. Um, using bioresources, uh, making um, uh, uh, product development of bioresources, biofuels of um, algae biogas, ethanol, etc. But the sustainable is the underlying keyword here. Next, marine climate and health, including pollution, is the fourth. As I mentioned already before, there are many things and substances in sea that shouldn't be there. And this is why we would have to investigate and model what kind of changes are brought about because of this pollution and what is happening with the pollution itself. Something that hasn't been modeled uh, so far yet is the, uh, uh, is the moving of pollution from uh, one region to another. In, in the sea. At least I wasn't able to find any good um, sources for that. And also competencies. But this has to do with uh, international law already. Uh, the next topic brings us closer to engineering. And we have uh, shipbuilding, hydrodynamics here. We already are analyzing it, and I work with my professor on it. So materials, metals, modeling them, the characteristics, uh, collision. Well, let's not uh, go into this at the moment. It would take us a lot of time. Uh, load values. Constructions, all the things that could happen to uh, vessels and other objects in, in sea. What will happen if, um, if a vessel uh, runs into something? What if a um, wind generator is attacked, let's say, by ice a vessel? Biocomposites is a topic that is uh, um, already here, tested actively. And I believe that these are very good future materials. And looking at the options that we can already see today, then Stura Enzo, I think, has um, biocomposite that contains of bioplastic and uh, pulp. And it can be reprocessed seven times uh, without losing its um, uh, functional characteristics. 
today the material that uh, vessels, um, wind generators are made of cannot be reprocessed. And on the video that you can see on the screen, this shows you machine learning. So it counts objects that move in the uh, sea, sea bottom. You can't really see the items themselves, but you can see the colorful squares. And it counts uh, pieces of, of plastic. So as you can see, it's, um, there's, there's a lot of it in, this, in, in, in the water. And that's uh, the pollution. For me, it was quite shocking to look at. Uh, six is uh, marine technologies and architecture or constructions, which we could also say is something that a competence that we already have. We have a professor at least in our college already working on that. And um, what they focus on, what they study, are various uh, things related to vessels, dynamics, collision dynamics, for example, but also other aspects, sea keeping resistance and, and so on. So offshore wind farms, is, a, is another area, and we are focusing on floating uh, wind farms. So what would uh, their behavior be like if there are waves, currents, ice? Uh, today we can model everything, and we can see when the constructions would give in, uh, get damaged, and uh, what is their resistance, level of resistance. Seventh topic is blue energy. I think this is quite um, well known already. The volumes for Estonia today are small, but renewable energy uh, would be something that would help us reach our climate neutrality uh, objectives. But it also helps to restore indirectly the good situation or conditions of uh, the natural environment. Uh, under Blue Economy, we talk about uh, flexible solutions, mapping them, um, hydrogen, and the opportunities for uh, hydrogen, and also power to X. So the main problem today is that if we have a wind farm, offshore wind farm, or we have uh, PV panels out at sea, so we can produce energy, but we cannot transport the energy that is generated. We don't have a cable there, we don't have a connection to that. So the question now is, will the government make uh, huge efforts to build the grid or will we find new ways of storing energy and how could it be stored? Would it be hydrogen? Would the hydrogen be synthesized into something else? What would make most sense? What would have the greatest potential? And also, uh, what would be most um, interesting for, or most, most useful? So wind is not the only option. We have uh, solar energy, we have bioenergy, we have geothermal energy, but the principles here are the same. Now, when we talk about um, having a center of competence on land, we also foresee that we will have a demo base at sea. So according to our vision, we would have a marked area uh, on water, on sea, where we would run tests, surveys, um, we can study and research the area, we can uh, test our smart solutions there. And um, 
we can also analyze and, and study various chemical and physical processes that take place uh, in the water and on sea. But also various um, energy technology solutions, very practical solutions that we can test there. So let's say we have been modeling something, we have results, we have the competencies, uh, in theory uh, at least, we have the theoretical competencies, then it would be very useful to have a physical place out at sea where we can put these ideas and theories to test. And the outputs. What would uh, the outputs be for Blue Economy? For example, issuing the smart sea passports, for example, if we have an area mapped, we can issue a passport and if someone comes, let's say, uh, for fishing purposes, for wind park building purposes, they would get the information that we have and um, they would get the knowledge about what is happening in this particular area and uh, what the characteristics and, and problems might be. But also additional information for constructions on land, or on shore and other engineering know-how. In addition to labs, we have also thought about a simulator, about uh, creating digital twins, but also using various databases, as I already mentioned, and bringing the data together. Our objectives and uh, uh, green transition, it was already mentioned that we plan to contribute to reaching the goals of the green transition. And um, uh, what should it look like? Um, here we can see something that was made by NASA. It's, it's a very nice program and they study various areas. They have satellites that um, forward data. So what they do is they monitor the situation, the environment, various systems. They don't study a particular region or small area, but they do it more globally. Uh, our aim is to focus on the Baltic Sea, to use the layers here and add these layers to the Baltic Sea in terms of knowledge. Keep in mind what the local community, local people uh, would need and want, what the region as such would need and want, and we want to add that to the models that we create. So, as I said before, we want to have a comprehensive approach in order to combine the opportunities um, in the most uh, beneficial way, while also taking into account the well-being of all parties and also the tolerance levels of all parties and to use the competencies that we have in our university, uh, that our partners have, um, and perhaps there are more sources for um, knowledge and know-how. To conclude, in our vision, uh, the Competence Center on Blue Economy uh, would provide an input for policy making, uh, planners, uh, but also media and the general public in, in general. Uh, the center would be international and we want to help with our competencies and to contribute to the region based on our situation today and based on the situation of our island, our country today. So we are trying to find ways and areas where we can give back something uh, to the environment to restore a better situation and we would work within our competencies. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>
Thank you. Referencing back to what Professor Sergeyev said, this is the vision. It's quite a challenge, and the seven areas merit that you described would be worth a separate conference, separate event um, in the future. Now, being part of the small Taltec team uh, here, I feel that we need to believe more in what we are doing. There is actually no turning back. On the right, I can see lots of company representatives uh, here. We are facing great expectations. There are also companies who are not here today, but we are speaking about um, aquaculture companies. We are talking about energy. Uh, in the field of energy, we the ball is in the court of the state. Uh, we are waiting for detailed plans and strategies for energy generations. But on the other hand, from the point of view of aquaculture, once again, this the infrastructure needs to be developed, and we are um, continuing along this path. I am now happy to introduce our next speaker from Canada, uh, University of Prince Edward Island, and Dr. Laurie Brinklow from the Institute of Island Studies. So she is there. And before I hand over the floor to her, uh, the people here who were also here 30 years ago remember uh, an institution called the Islands Institute back then. And there's nothing better than the forget forgotten past. For, from our point of view, uh, Laurie Brinklow uh, is representing the Institute of Island Studies of uh, University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, 20 years ago, we had a person uh, from the, their team visiting us, and we were thinking about grand future. We believed that 20, we believed 20 years ago that we would have a huge island studies center here, and now 20 years later, we are looking at this once again. And uh, Dr. Brinklow is going to speak about uh, how the Institute of Island Studies at the University of Prince Edward Island has reached its current status. It has been acknowledged by UNESCO as one of the Green Islands idea keeper. It is absolutely wonderful to be here um, zooming in um, on this uh, lovely August morning. It's still morning here and I think it might be still morning there or pretty close to noon. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking with you today. My first introduction to Sarama was in 1991 when I attended attended the island games in Oland Islands, Finland. And we were invited, I was part of the cultural delegation, and we were invited on board the Russian research vessel that had brought this, the athletes from Sarama to Oland and uh, had a lovely coffee and were gifted a beautiful tray that we've used in our office for years. So that was a, a pretty amazing um, introduction to your island. And then um, to learn that um, uh, that you're interested in, um, or that Bilou and Merritt are, are interested in, in getting into island studies in a big way, we were just absolutely thrilled to be part of, become part of the conversation. Um, and as uh, only in the last week or so, um, on July 22nd, our ferry that brings that links Prince Edward Island to Nova Scotia, the, the mainland of Canada, um, had a fire. And so they decided to bring in a, a new vessel to try it out and uh, see if it worked. And it's the MV Sarama. So as uh, Merritt says, there are no coincidences. And um, I'm really absolutely delighted that I could share some of my experience with the Institute of Island Studies with you here today. And so I'm going to... Um, 
I do have a PowerPoint and uh, just uh, quickly run through some slides that talk about our work here at the Institute of Island Studies and then hopefully we can have a conversation or continue the conversation about um, how Island Studies and Sarama, we can all become part, we would love to welcome you into our, our Island Studies family. So here we go. Um, let's see if I can find, I had it up here earlier and there it is. And I will share. And is it coming? Oh my, I think I have too many. Okay, I'm not finding the right slide. I did have it here earlier and let's find it again. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was here and now I just absolutely can't find it. <laughs> Try one more time. Looks like you're going through my whole screen. I'm sorry. Where's the right file? Oh my. Okay. Hello, Lori. Yes. What's going we can, on? Uh, we have your PowerPoint here, so we we'll put it on from here. That would be good. Yeah, Thank and you. then you can start, and I will let you know when the pictures are coming. So, okay. please proceed. Thank you. Yeah, I did notice that there was one typo in the end, so <laughs> I'll try and point that. I, I apologize for that. It is fixed in the right one. Um, so yes, I'm here at the Institute of Island Studies at the University of Prince Edward Island, which is on the east coast of Canada. And um, we have, uh, this Institute of Island Studies has been in existence since 1985. And it was created when um, Harry Bagwell, who was the original director, was, um, had the idea that Prince Edward Island and the island-ness of Prince Edward Island was something pretty special. He had been over on our sister island of Newfoundland and was recognizing the culture, the vibrancy of the place and thinking we can, um, th there's something about the island nature of an island that is worth exploring. And so he created uh, with the help of our university at, at Prince Edward Island, the Institute of Island Studies. It's a very small institute. We have um, a mandate which um, includes, you know, outreach to the community. It includes uh, doing research. It includes celebrating the culture and environment and education of our island. And um, so um, we have made ourselves, our vision is to be the leading um, uh, proponent of island studies in the world. Um, we're hoping, um, in, uh, I guess it was in 1992, we had our first international conference where we invited islanders, we invited 52 islanders from 24 islands from around the world to join us on Prince Edward Island to talk about islands and island studies. And out of that grew a number of organizations and initiatives, and it's shaped our whole um, 
mindset around islands because it seemed that we once we were together it just you you talked we just talked and talked and talked and they talk people talked from the time they got on the plane got off the plane in prince edward island till the time they left and we realized that there was something magical here that needed to be explored so in um 1993 we um or we proposed um um, um, it was a minor in island studies, um, and then that was followed by a master of arts in island studies. We got a Canada research chair in island studies, and that's when Godfrey Baldacchino came to us. That would be in the mid 2000s. And um, since then, we have created this amazing network of islanders and island studies experts from around the world. So much so that we have a journal, the Island Studies Journal. There's another that's um, offered by um, the, the institutional home was the University of Prince Edward Island for the longest time. It was, um, then um, we are we contribute to Shima, which is a, an islands journal that publishes out of Australia. There's a number of coastal and marine journals. There are tourism journals. All of these things that we feed into because we want to make sure that islands, you know, we are separate and independent, but we're also connected. That's the wonderful thing about islands is that you have this dichotomy, this binary almost, and then all along the, the route is all of the different interconnections. Um, we're also part of the International Small Island Studies Association, and I'm the president, um, just the incoming president voted in, in um, June in uh, Croatia when we had our most recent conference and it looks like uh, we, we are on a two-year cycle and our next conference will be probably in Lombok in Indonesia and we will be putting the invitation out for everyone to uh, to join us there. Um, we also have the North Atlantic Forum which is another um, interesting um, organization. It's, we call it a collegial network of islanders and island organizations, communities, uh, universities, and government people from across the North Atlantic. And so there's another opportunity for Sarama to become involved with the North Atlantic Forum. This usually happens every couple of years as well. And we were hoping in, I think it was when the pandemic uh, hit in 2020, that was supposed to be in Ireland. Um, and I'm not quite sure. I, I need to get in touch with my island colleagues to find out what our Ireland colleagues whether or not we can go ahead with it. And if not, find another island to host this lovely gathering of, of people from around the North Atlantic. Sorry, and sorry to break in. We have yes. now control over your PowerPoint. So oh, I run through okay. the first slides and we are on local emphasis, global reach. The first okay. slide of island study, so please, if you can lead us through and say, say when you want us to switch the slide. So, so you know. I can't see it. You can't Are see you it. Able to? You, you have to trust us. Oh. <laughs> Simple game of trust. <laughs> and, and I must need to know, okay, let me find where I, because I need to have a version of it here. Um, on my screen, I... Ah, oh boy. Okay, maybe you'll have to tell me. I can't find it really quickly on my uh, laptop okay. here. I've lost all so, of my things. So what's I can do next? that. So okay. the slide says Island Studies, University of Prince Edward Island, and this is opening yes. slide of the official presentation as we take it. So I'll switch it right now. Okay. And it says, oh, it has a complicated scheme on it. Oh, <laughs> might that be our organizational chart? That's so it. That's you can skip over that. That that's fine. It's it just shows how we fit in with the in, uh, with the university and uh, where we fit and and in the structure. Okay, vision and four point mandate. Yes. So this is our mandate. Uh, you can see it there. And the fourth one was the one where we decided um, that we need to become more international. We had been doing all of this local stuff and then we decided, OK, that fourth point of the international work, we either do it big or go home. So we decided to do it big. And that's when we got really involved in island studies around the world. OK, next slide, please. That's it. All right, so 
we have a number of different uh, arms of the Institute of Island Studies. One of them is our publishing arm. And so we publish books, two, about three or four books a year. And you can see that book with the, the purple on it, uh, um, the, the Blue My Islands, The House I Sleep In at Night. That's my, my own book of poetry. And I'm really pleased that uh, we were able to publish it. And it is exploring island nests because that's one of the words that we use a lot in island studies. What are some of those factors about being that live on an island? We published um, many uh, the, the Black Horses, From Black Horses to White Steeds is on um, community development and in rural areas because we're also um, part of the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. Um, so it's looking at the crossover between islands and rural. So you can see that lovely active publishing program that we continue to disseminate our, our work through our publishing program. Next, please. Done. So these are some of the conferences that we've hosted over the years. Um, you'll see up in the, the top, the North Atlantic Forum, uh, which we've hosted uh, starting in 1998 in Prince Edward Island. And it's been to Newfoundland, it's been to Shetland, um, it's been to Iceland. Um, maybe sometime we'll host it in Sarama. That would be amazing. Uh, we also have been, uh, in recent years, working with um, the <clears throat> in sustainability, sustainability initiatives. So we hosted the Building Small Island Resilience to Global Ch Climate Change Conference that looked at islands and climate change uh, and bringing in various um, speakers from around the world to, to look at... Um, how islands can adapt to climate change because um, mitigation uh, is one um, step, but then we really do need to work towards ad adapting because small islands are so at the forefront of it. The other one that we've been involved with is um, in um, is um, global. Um, what am I trying to say here? Small island economies and so how economies and governance work together. And so if we are a subnational island jurisdiction as opposed to be as opposed to being independent because we're part of Canada, what are some of the powers that we can leverage as a province that we um, are able to bring, um, make, you know, uh, to improve our situation here on Prince Edward Island and use some of those powers and levers that we have to um, make change that we need to make change here. The one that's coming up, this islands, islandness and climate change in um, the University of Aruba, this is coming up in, in 2023. And this will be bringing together some of those conversations around island studies and climate change on small islands. Next, please. Done. One of the other things that we've been doing, and this was pre-pandemic, and we need to start thinking about doing these public symposia again, is hosting two of these a year that thinking ahead to what are some of the issues that are of utmost importance to Prince Edward Islanders. And so, as you can see here, we've had very many um, different kinds of um, topics, and we bring in speakers from mostly Canada, but sometimes from around the world. You'll see Gudrun Thora, Gunnar's daughter there from Iceland, coming to speak with us about Icelandic uh, tourism and Icelandic literature. Um, we have uh, colleagues in the United States with the Island Institute in Maine and um, all around the world that we can bring in these people. And uh, it's always a, a lively conversation. We often um, pair them up with policymakers and government so that they can have meetings with government officials to talk about some of their ideas and, and try and get a conversation going and, and maybe we can learn from one another. And this whole idea of learning from other islands Islands as opposed to learning from big mainlands is, is one of the, the strong threads of our work here at the Institute. Next, please. It's on. Um, I'm trying to see. This is our lecture series, I believe. Um, this, uh, we host these um, yearly during the pandemic. 
able to go online and do a few of them globally. And it was really fun zooming in people from all around the world. I think we'll be going back in the fall to having these done in person. We covered everything there. You can see on the slide from um, uh, Vanuatu's um, um, the hurricane and the devastation that happened, but the resilience that those people showed in the face of the disaster. Um, my particular interest is in climate, is in art and um, islands. And so we did a, a, had a lecture from a woman who's investigating art and climate change on Prince Edward Island. Um, next, please. Done. This is one of the, uh, the the ones that I was talking about. This is Prince Edward Island. As you can see, um, the three uh, versions of our island as the sea level rises. And it was quite a shock to me that to learn that in perhaps since as soon as 80 years from now, we might be Prince Edward Islands with sea level rise and um, cutting off Prince Edward Island at those narrowest points. So again, these are just some of the preoccupations that, that we um, um, have as well as you know our, our economy our climate change our politics um, governance it, we have lots of different research projects going on and I think they'll come up here shortly next please done um, I'm trying to see what this one is it's kind of on a on a slant <laughs> so I'm not seeing the um, it says about the, research Research. Okay, yes, these are some of the, okay, yeah, project well-being. This is what uh, we're undergoing now. So this is um, thinking about beyond what makes success in a place, beyond the GDP and the GNP and all of those things. How about well-being? How about how well people live in a place? And uh, so this is an ongoing research project funded by our provincial government for four years, and we're about ready to launch a report in the fall to the public, and this is looking at indicators of well-being. And it ties in with the happiness index that um, another island has uh, uh, got going over the, the past number of years, and what makes people happy here. We're also looking at um, and different uh, over the years we've had no numerous research projects um, and uh, that have shown born fruit one of them was a, a shirk funded project so shirk is the social sciences and humanities research council and we were looking at those issues of governance and how um, subnational island jurisdictions like what we are have some of those powers how can we use those powers to create better societies versus what main our um, uh, sovereign states have and so how can we work together so we call that the uh, um, sustainable island futures project next master of arts studies oh this is my favorite well they're all my favorite. I can't have a favorite child, can I? Um, the Master of Arts and Island Studies program is a, um, it started in 2003 and I'm a graduate of it. I graduated in 2007 and my particular interest was in literature on small islands. But as you can see here, we have um, a thesis program as well as um, a work um, study program. It's an experiential learning program where people come and they, in addition to their coursework, they take, um, uh, two courses where they're doing research projects, applied research projects with a government organization or an NGO or a business. And uh, so those are some of the um, different photographs that you can see there of our students from around uh, visiting places around the world. And uh, we had about, oh, 50 to 60 graduates now in the program, and we have another 60 to 70 students in the program. The biggest cohort is the... Um, and well, we're getting a lot of interest in island tourism and sustainable island communities and international relations and island public policy. Those are the three streams. So there, that's about half of the students and the other half are doing theses, which are curiosity based. And they can choose something from islands um, around the world. We like it to be comparative, if at all possible, so that you can bring in lessons from other islands and apply them to our island. Next, please. Huh? This is our UNESCO chair. Yes, this is uh, Dr. Jean Mitchell uh, from Prince Edward Island, and uh, she is in the sociology anthropology department here at UPEI. And uh, we had the UNESCO, we were very su successful in. 
2016 in securing this designation. There's no money that goes with it, unfortunately. It's it's just an honorific, but we're part of a, a worldwide network of UNESCO chairs that are dealing with all kinds of aspects of society. So ours is in in uh, climate or um, island studies and sustainable communities. So Jean is just the new one. We had Jim Randall for four years, and Godfrey Baldacchino shared the position with him for a couple of those years. But now Jean is our UNESCO chair. Her particular interest is in the South Pacific and uh, Vanuatu, and so we're hoping to build bridges with the South Pacific, the um, Caribbean, and uh, the North Atlantic um, over the next four years of her reign. And we have um, a conference, that's the one that's going to be hosted in, in or held in um, Aruba next year is under that aegis. Next, please. Done. These are some of the networks that we are part of and you can see it's pretty wide ranging um, the north atlantic forum i mentioned that started in 1998 and it's still ongoing with conferences reti which is the réseau d'excellence territoire insular is um, a network of island universities you can see university of malta is there as well with its small states institute um ASISA, that's the one that i was recently elected president of the international small island studies association we also have very strong ties with the university of highlands and islands in shetland and my colleague dr andrew jennings is um, uh, also teaches an island studies program he has offers the mlit in island studies and has graduated some really amazing students as well so you can you can see the list. I won't go through them all. Next, please. <coughs> oh, and there's some more. <laughs> so there's quite a few out there. <laughs> yes. Okay, you can go on. Challenges and opportunities now. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, this is where um, we would like to start talking about what are some of the things that we can we can do together. You know, we have all of these linkages around the world. We would love to um, tap you in um, in some way to what we're doing here at the Institute and um, reach out, do outreach to other um, organizations from around the world that might be of interest and of specific of benefit to Sarama. Um, and eventually, um, as I mentioned, we do have the Master of Arts in Island Studies program, but we would like to have a PhD in Island Studies at some point. And we are talking with the Memorial University in Newfoundland about uh, maybe a shared PhD to start with. Next, please. This site, oh, this was our um, recent photograph taken at the um, ASISA conference in Croatia. We were on um, Dugiotok, which is uh, an island off the coast of, of Zadar. And uh, you can see we had about 120 delegates at this, this conference. So there are a lot of people out there doing island studies and a lot of people who are passionate about it. And uh, so I'm hoping that um, we might be able to continue this conversation over the next year to see, a years, coming years, to see what we might be able to do as, as a team. Next, please. And that's me. There is our little global island. You can think of Prince Edward Island as an island. You can think of Sarama as an island. But if you think of the planet Earth as an island in space, it's pretty mind-boggling, and so that's that's where we're we're dreaming big. We're dreaming up right there with with the globe out there in space. So, hoping that we can join together across the North Atlantic and um, do some amazing things. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, Franz, for for encouragement, and uh, we'll let you go now. It's still morning. <laughs> It's you still morning. A, it's my breakfast you can have a nap. time. But uh, I get a note from the Taltec people that uh, we will have a cooperation and we will see you soon. And as we said, hopefully in person. Thank you once more very much. Okay, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Yeah, Many thanks for listening, everybody. It was a very colorful uh, overview about um, islands and islands' life. And that would be the first block or part. Uh, this is the first um, topic that Merit uh, showed us in the previous presentation that is not so closely linked to the engineering, but it's not too far either. 
it uh, it still um, uh, we really enjoyed the the way uh, that we now heard the um, uh, th what we heard that people from islands when they come together they can uh, talk and talk and talk because they share so many things in common but now here in Sarama it's time for coffee break soon but as I promised we will have a round of questions and answers in uh, in the end of the first session perhaps we will um, not ask so many questions in the um, uh, from the rector but uh, the first question to the rector is that uh, all these ideas will not fit into the small building of uh, the college so um, uh, will there be uh, more be uh, more premises built? Um, the university has resources for housing um, all these ideas and people working on them, but um, uh, Kurasara is a university town and it will remain one. Thank you. This is the identity that the community was uh, hoping for. Now, uh, the question uh, for Madis. So, you as the previous uh, municipal mayor, you know uh, whether the university is uh, big enough or too big for the island of Sarama. Well, Sarama has many um, benefits. Uh, there are some things that are more easily implemented on the island of Sarama or Hiyoma. So, we have certain challenges. We are a bit isolated, perhaps, from the mainland in a way, but it also brings opportunities, so the local municipalities certainly can contribute and help in developing the university, but it's also very pleasing to hear that the university is here to stay and the visions are here uh, so that we would have a dream that we can move towards. So in the future, I believe that we can talk about even better uh, um, context for our university in uh, in Sarama. Okay, so in 15 years we will have a, a university campus and a conference center built in Kurasara, and it would bring together more than uh, five times more people than today. Yes, but now let's um, continue, and after the break we will have more uh, practical view of things. Um, and uh, for coffee break, we have 30 minutes, so let's continue 40 minutes past 12 again. And the coffee is served uh, upstairs as, um, as in, the, in the morning. Thank you. I did you So. Advisor to the Directorate General of Research and Innovation at the European Commission. So that was the t tough task that the rector uh, carried out as well, reading out this title, but he is from Brussels. So from the point of view of Brussels, what you have heard so far, has it been reasonable? What you said right now or no, 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 what was said before the coffee break. So we are hoping for good news from Brussels. Aha, uh -huh. I have a few slides, but mostly I will be speaking my own mind. So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy. Uh, to see that the European uh, Research and European uh, Conference uh, Commission have been placed in the practical session, not under the political uh, statements. Uh, so although DGs of the Commission remind us of ministries on the national level, they do operate um, on a political uh, level, but uh, our DG does directly finance uh, research. The rest of the financing goes from member states, and I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and uh, we were 
told that it would be nice if somebody came from European uh, Commission. Uh, we have two brave ladies there, uh, Signe Razzo, uh, Director General, and um, another colleague who has uh, long served on the board of uh, Teltec. Um, I got the pleasant task of coming to Kuresara for the first time this summer, unlike uh, Rector Titlang. So um, I thought I'd uh, show you a few of the main ideas that are currently circling in the European Commission and uh, say, um, add on a few of my own ideas that uh, I got uh, listening to the presentations in, in the morning as well as during my 15 years career at the Commission. So, first of all, the political side. Specifically, many of you are not concerned by this because uh, this is the European um, research policy. But as we have people from the college and, and Taltec here as well, it would be perhaps uh, useful to think about the positioning of uh, the college within the European research space. Um, a few years back, uh, we uh, adopted the new European research area uh, strategy. And perhaps one of the wishes behind the strategy from the point of view of the Commission is that while in the past uh, the research area strategy has been sort of a, let's say, um, generally worded paper, then now it should identify a list of uh, activities. So here on this slide uh, you see that uh, 20 actions concerning the European research area uh, have been uh, defined and the states have to decide which of these actions they want to partake in. So this is the list of the 20 actions. So perhaps from your point of view, what could be the one or the few of those activities which could encompass the uh, college's mission as well. I, I hope that these slides can be distributed later. You don't need to take notes right now. I'm, I hope that the organizers are willing to share them afterwards. And I think what's interesting here is the second block, 10 to 14. So in addition to um, shaping the general research landscape, we also have practical and um, let's say applied areas here. And this is something that is new uh, as concerns the European research policy. And it's not unique to the research policy. It has been characteristic uh, of uh, European policies in general during the last 10 years, in addition to just uh, um, giving general guidelines um, the public sector has also been given uh, sort of this uh, fair or, or guiding role of, of showing where we are going so that the public sector should be um, somebody who um, sets directions and, and also uh, accompanies parties. Uh, one of the people who has uh, voiced this is uh, Maria Mikzotakis, who has been an advisor to concerning the European uh, Commission research uh, policy for quite some time. And this has not um, been characteristic of the European Commission only, but also of member states, for example, industrial policies. In Estonia, it seems that we are moving in the same direction. So uh, what could be the role of islands in general and Kuresare College uh, specifically could keep could perhaps be assessed in the context of this mission-based approach of, of the public sector. But 
Um, just like Taltec, uh, European universities uh, not only do research, but they also teach. So we also have uh, the European higher education strategy. And in recent years, uh, we have tried to develop better links between the research and the uh, teaching aspect. Um, so on the policy level, those two have approached each other. And one of the documents reflecting this, uh, or one of the um, concepts uh, reflecting this, are European university alliances. Uh, Tartu University is part of the Enlight Alliance. Uh, uh, Taltec uh, participates in Eurotech. And this means that universities that think alike and are based in Europe cooperate. Um, the blue economy that we are speaking about uh, today, uh, would it be part of, uh, could it be part of a mandate of such an alliance? Um, I don't know, perhaps, but one of the tasks of the European research policy is to create uh, cooperation between institutions. There is a lot of self-financing, as I will show you later, involved as well. But one of the m main objectives is to provide or induce cooperation between uh, countries and institutions. So our main financing instrument is the European Research Programme Horizon. In the new uh, seven-year uh, financial framework, uh, the amount will be more than 90 million euros, uh, uh, billion euros. Um, of course, the increase hasn't been nearly enough to cover uh, all quality projects. However, although budgets um, generally tend to decrease, what we have seen is an increase in R&D spending and the share of R&D spending in the general EU budget. This is a trend that has um, been witnessed in the last years, and I hope it will remain valid. So this is a sign of the fact that research is considered important. Uh, the researches are increasing, whether it's enough or not. Well, as you know, this is always a, a question of debates. Those who know European budgeting know that uh, the biggest amount of money goes to common agricultural policy, uh, policy and structural funds. But both uh, the CAP as well as uh, quite a big part and an increasing part of structural funds are actually directed at research and innovation. So Horizon Europe is not the only program that uh, could help Kurasara College's vision to be financed, but there are a number of other financing sources on the European level, including structure of funds that have already been used to develop the competence center on small craft here and, and can be done in the future. So I think that combining different financing sources uh, would be the best way to finance this vision. If you look at this slide, then about a half, the light blue part of the financing is related to let's say, uh, social or global challenges. Um, this means that every time we go and ask for the taxpayer's money, we also need to explain or you need to explain what is the problem that is being solved, why it is of social significance. And I think college uh, vision had a number of very good references to EU documents and policies, but uh, when applying for local and national and European uh, level project money, it is important to underline that we are doing this because this is going to help with this particular problem. And bioeconomy here is the field 
which uh, uh, mainly mm, is used to finance uh, uh, environmental projects, but we also have this dark blue and the green parts where we have uh, uh, researchers and companies who can ask for money without uh, thematic uh, um, limitations. For example, when SMEs uh, go to ask for money for technologically challenging projects, then they go into this little green sector and uh, researchers go into this dark blue s sector. So, in fact, uh, the financing uh, possibilities for blue economy projects are wider, but the targeted field specific. Uh, Financing can be fi found in the social challenges sector, in this light blue sector. Uh, when we look at the last Horizon 2020 program, seven, seven year framework program, its budget was a bit smaller. And this is how this program enabled uh, cooperation. So, uh, it has been estimated that about two million different individual collaborations were generated. But what we also can see is how much industry has been involved in the R&D project. And this is once again a change that has become evident during the last I'm not sure whether we can even say decade, but about 10 years. So we have shifted our attention to the innovation side of the R&D, uh, applying the generated knowledge within the society, uh, and, and perhaps not so much direct the money at creating uh, new knowledge. Uh, more of the financing has uh, moved towards applied. Uh, when we talk about Estonia, when we are speaking about the 1% research uh, financing, then a lot of this is directed at innovation as well, because the knowledge side is already pretty well covered. And I perhaps from the point of view of Kurasara College is, is this dual role. Uh, on the one side, you're a research center generating new knowledge, but on the other side, you can also be somebody who imports the knowledge already generated in the world and helps deploy it, apply it. And um, I heard it uh, from different speeches, but I didn't find it very much in the in the specific vision, the, the link with the local community, its specificities, its needs. This is perhaps the, the most reasonable and most practical way for um, using the resources. If you look at this, uh, these numbers, then two thirds of the financing has gone to collaborative projects involving industry, that means to practical application of generated knowledge. Um, one aspect uh, that has always been characteristic of European uh, research financing is the question, what are we actually financing? And um, now we have the aspect of strategic planning. And the program has actually been sort of split in two. What are the priorities uh, for spending? And this sort of translation between the general directions and uh, let's say annual or biannual or, or triannual plans uh, has not been there in the past, but now it is clearly there. And the second strategic plan for the current Horizon program, 2025 to 2027, is about to start in autumn and probably by the end of the year, um, the first drafts will become public. And this is the place where it is, it is possible to 
let's say, to lobby or to introduce your own vision to check whether what the activities you are planning to undertake uh, coincide with what is being planned as priorities on the European uh, level. Uh, European Commission comes out with a proposal and then 27 member states analyze it from their point of view and try to agree on a common position so the direction does not come from Brussels uh, per se but uh, as anything in the research policy is a common agreement between the member states. Of course, co the Commission has uh, its own role here. Um, the uh, member states have different processes and different ideas and the original draft very often has a very big role in the final document but this is let's say the procedural point where it is possible to impact what will be financed from the European money during the coming f three years and it is important uh, first of all to to make sure in order to make sure that your ideas will fall under uh, what will be financed, is it is important to find out who in Europe is dealing or is interested in the same topics. For example, if we're talking about climate uh, questions, which are perhaps a bit more acute um, compared to, say, cultural heritage questions or other soft topics, if I if I dare to put the island life under this. Uh, so, the, let's say the soft topics get a bit less money compared to the uh, more elaborate uh, technological uh, topics. And uh, about a quarter uh, of the money, um, I see Maya Lisa in the back row, uh, this goes to European partnerships. She m managed the discussions in 2017 on the European level when Estonia was uh, was the pre held the presidency of the EU Council, and and I don't know whether it was her idea or or uh, somebody else's. Um, th th there was this question of how to coordinate. Uh, everything that is happening uh, in a topic, it's difficult for a small presidency concerned. It, it will be a question for Kurasara uh, College as well, uh, how to participate in everything that happens. Uh, an Estonian writer uh, once, you know, fought out a joke. What what can one uh, a smart person do to cover the questions by a hundred stupid people. Uh, but you have to think about cooperation networks and how to participate in different networks. Uh, college here, of course, has Taltex uh, structure that it can use. Uh, we have the Europe Estonian uh, environmental agency, Estonian research agency, who is the main representative of Estonia on the program committee of the Horizon program. So you have to have a network and you have to know the people who are either obliged or have the time to participate in all of those uh, cooperation organizations. Uh, but um, coming back to <laughs> partnerships, uh, Perhaps partnerships could be more ad hoc and shorter and and uh, target based, but they tend to become long term anyway because targets you know grow into new targets. So here you can see all different kinds of partnerships in different colors uh, based on uh, whether they are already funded or programmed. But if you can. Uh, find in the uh, gr six column with a green. I think that uh, we have had on our list three different partners mm, that uh, is relate in a topic 
and in the call round that uh, has been related directly to um, the blue economy. However, whether those existing partnerships on the European level coincide, coincide with your vision, you have to research. Um, but we have, you know, they were called Euronets. Uh, um, you have to research them, and these are places where, um, let's say, research agenda is being agreed between partners, and then financing is sought, own financing, companies, and the uh, European Commission can help here. So the blue economy here if I am not mistaken, has uh, country self-financing of about 300 million euros, and the Commission has added uh, 350 million on top of this. So uh, Estonia has uh, increased its role in partnerships. When I first started thinking about Saarema, then it reminds me of Iceland. Iceland is also small, but it's very um, active and efficient. Um, you know, the same way uh, Sarama seems from looking uh, when looking from the continent. And then I uh, met the head of the Icelandic uh, Research Council at the Estonian Research Council's meeting. And he said that they participate in every single partnership. They don't know how important this is. Uh, mm, perhaps the impact here and there is different, but they say that together with others, we can uh, get much better conditions than uh, doing it on loan. So the point here is that whatever the college is planning to do, uh, it is important to plan activities um, and perhaps also financing uh, by way of finding existing partnerships on the European level. Perhaps uh, let's a good starting point before uh, starting doing it on your own. And I think that the uh, previous uh, uh, presentation also showed how welcome you are to participate in all kinds of different uh, networks first learn and then start contributing. And then, uh, as I said, m being mission-based is one of the, let's say, new key ingredients in EU policies. We already have some uh, pilots in the uh, research uh, program. Uh, five missions were selected uh, where by the year 2030, um, social issues could be resolved from, a, let's say, a significant point to a significant level. One of them has to do with uh, ocean and waters. I must say that um, I don't really know the Estonian share in this mission, but when the mission was adopted last autumn, um, the mission was adopted last autumn. Application programs have been launched, launched and as far as I know, there are uh, pilot programs going on in different uh, geographic locations. One of them is related to the Baltic and Nordic Sea. I don't know who is the Estonian partner here, but Uh, those five missions also have, or the specifically the Ocean and Waters mission, has a number of specific uh, activities that have already been agreed. For example, when we are talking about the state of, uh, of uh, water bodies, mm, then uh, to increase the quality of ocean and waters, specific actions have uh, already been specific. Uh, and the information is public to everyone. Being part of this network is very useful, um, once again. So this is uh, the official uh, part of my presentation, and then a few, let's say, unofficial ideas on top. First of all, collaboration is key. And since you are Taltec College and Blue Economy is a huge topping. 
topic. Um, I mean, we have the same problem in the European Commission. Um, everybody is focusing on something uh, specific and you need cooperation partners. Um, here, once again, you need other partners, uh, University of Life Sciences, uh, Environmental in uh, Investment Center, and so on. But from my point of view, what is very important is creating ties to the local uh, business environment and local community. And based on this, uh, you can grow in the future at uh, new fields on top of that. And perhaps what can be done here is to offer uh, the college up as a sort of a testing ground, as was mentioned in the vision. So if you want to do something internationally, for example, as a company, we can offer you the knowledge and data that we have, get back additional data, so uh, we're talking about resources here, not only the sea, but also uh, data and our entrepreneurial use of it. Data as a resource is becoming e increasingly valuable. Uh, European Commission is stressing the need to have different partners in, in different parts of Europe. And we don't want to have just a few centers of excellences. And not only uh, blue economy, it's not only the blue economy that wants to be green, We everybody wants to be green. Some of us are from Tallinn and some of us are from uh, uh, Brussels. It's not always easy to come here, but if you happen in Brussels, contact us at the Commission. Uh, you can participate in program committees or what I have always recommended if you want to get a better understanding of how financing works, sign up as project evaluators. It gives you a very good experience, not only because you can see what other people are proposing, but it's also well, f well remunerated. And this is a good way of understanding what kinds of projects are written better, can be financed more easily, and so on. So you're always welcome to Brussels. You're a small green town. Come to us and see. Uh, and uh, the corona has also taught uh, us digital communication. So you are always welcome to invite us uh, to participate in your local or national or international events that I understand are already in the process of planning. And the final thing, um, I uh, flew in by plane um, this morning. Perhaps uh, you could consider electric planes. Norway has already decided that regional flights in the future uh, will be electrical, so per that's perhaps one pilot project that could be decided on the national level. Uh, Kärdla and Kuresaare uh, flights to our island capitals um, in the course of the next procurement could be defined as electric flights. This would be a step towards a green future and Perhaps that's a nice dream to be realized as part of the strategy. Thank you, Diet Jurima. I, I wanted to um, make a joke that, um, like in the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the captain is recruiting crew, and then there's a long line uh, being formed of those who want to go and evaluate these projects. Actually, you don't have to come to me. Uh, there's a public database where you can sign up. And um, at one point, we thought that um, the evaluators should also uh, take turns. And then it was decided that the evaluators 
um, can only evaluate a certain number of projects before someone else would have to take over. So there's always a need for evaluators, so I encourage you to join and whether you will be picked or not, uh, this time it doesn't perhaps even matter that much, but at least um, try. Thank you so much. All the plans uh, that we make can only be realized uh, materialized if we know that someone is there to back us up and support us. But now let's move on and the next speaker is the head of the uh, Division for International Cooperation from the Rectorate of Strat uh, Rectorate's um, Strategic Office from Taltec, Mr. Reo Karu. And if you wanted to walk around during your presentation, you can pick up the microphone. Uh, thank you. I don't even know if I will be walking around with the mic, but it's important to save some energy. Well, I must admit, it's not my first time in Kurasara this year, and every time I'm here, for some reason, there's a heat wave. So every time I come to Kurasara, it's at least 30 degrees Celsius. And... Um, as far as I know, uh, the ideas uh, were not synchronized, uh, uh, but, I, but, I, but I heard something very similar or in the lines of my uh, thoughts and presentation. Uh, now the university has already stated that they really want to back up the um, uh, college here, but also the ecosystem that the college will Mm, uh, develop here. Uh, but I will now look into uh, the vision that we have at Taltec. If you have questions you want to ask more privately, you can approach me during the um, lunch that we will have. But now let's get started, and I will be talking about internationalization. In 2011, when I joined the university in the international collaboration team, then uh, I would say that the internationalization work uh, was just picking up very, very quickly. And even though the study programs and everything have changed uh, substantially, some principles are still the same. So why am I talking about these things? I think I want to give you a context, because if a university has certain partners, has alliances and networks, then in the university we have a specific team who works so that research, researchers and scientists would benefit from various projects and collaboration uh, opportunities. So first, a few facts. These figures, uh, many of you know, but perhaps not everybody. So all in all, we have more than 9,000 students at Taltec. 13% of them come from abroad, from about 20 countries, uh, 1,950 employees, and 17% of them come from abroad. Uh, the total budget is uh, 123.8 million euros, uh, and for R&D, the income is 55.3, and uh, uh, we have also collaboration for double degrees with other universities, which means that, for example, Kurasara College and uh, Uppsala University, they have a joint study program and why not? Next year we could have it on the list here as the sixth uh, international study program or double degree study program. So um, it's not our goal per se to be international, but it's the only way to be a good university. We have 129 research groups and I believe that more than 90% of them 
have researchers of various nationalities and uh, citizenships, so it's also very international. And two-thirds of our publications are published in collaboration with research researchers from other universities. So it's not just a nice figure. I think it, it, it speaks volumes. And um, if we look at our structure and uh, resources, and it seems that we are very open to the world because we have lecturers, professors coming from various countries through different channels that they have um, still with their home universities. And our students are very international. Well, then that means that there's uh, lots and lots of cooperation going on. What does it mean? We have more than 700 international collaboration agreements with other universities. 700 contracts need content. They need uh, working with. And this, in turn, doesn't only mean that officials uh, like me have to work with it, but also the academic staff, those who do research, who are trying to find funding for their projects and so on, they also have to do the uh, international collaboration. And uh, our aim here is to focus on fewer contracts or forms of collaboration, but focus on them more strongly. We participate in 90 or a bit more uh, international alliances or networks, and eight of them are, uh, I mean, people from all across uh, Taltec are involved in these, and they, these eight are listed on the slide. So we don't only use the resources that our people have, but we also seek uh, European grants. And I picked out eight projects. Uh, no, sorry, I, I marked in bold the three projects um, that, or networks that could be of interest to Kurasara College. So Nortec, Baltec, and Science Business uh, Network. Um, Nortec could be uh, the platform that uh, would be a very good starting point. Uh, Maria Kruzma is working on that. And uh, the reason why it's of great interest is that um, it's a very strong network of technical universities. So from uh, the nor Northern Europe and Baltic region, the universities uh, are actively participating in that. And in many programs, if we want uh, the programs to reflect our ideas as well, and I understand that this is the time and place to uh, share these thoughts with you, uh, it's important to find partners who would be interested in the same uh, matters, so that it wouldn't be just an Estonian project or program, but a Scandinavian and Baltic program. Other alliances uh, between universities also exist, and we belong to Eurotech, which also has very um, uh, strong members. Uh, now we have started three projects with, within this alliance, so not only trying to prepare and find new and, and fun and effective uh, study methods, but we also try to build a completely different form of cooperation with our local uh, ecosystems. And Kurasara College could be not perhaps a test uh, lab, but a, at least an example that we could use in order to find out ways of um, how to work with partners um, differently or more in innovatively. Uh, 
it's not only a challenge in Estonia where the population density and regional policy is a bit uh, questionable sometimes. Other European countries are facing the same problems. That's what we've seen. And the interest in uh, getting the local community involved is shared with many universities and countries. Now, moving on, uh, what is um, the basis for choosing collaboration partners for us? Uh, we have 700 partners. I mean, through networks, we might have a four-digit number of um, collaboration partners. And uh, it's quite difficult to do all this work uh, besides your uh, main competencies and tasks. So it's important to consider which way to go and to prioritize. So last year, we adopted the new development plan for the university. 2021 to 25, and international cooperation is an accelerator, and uh, it's inevitable that we do have to do it. So, in other words, if there's a project, if there's a challenge uh, that has a global impact, we have to go international. If we are trying to solve a problem in Sarama, uh, in the Baltic Sea, um, then the impact has to reach outside the local region, the local dimension. But at the same time, it should also benefit the local community, because without that, uh, it wouldn't make sense for us to work on these challenges. We also want to be uh, more visible, and we want to have a greater impact, uh, which means that um, we try to build capacity through uh, competition-based research funding, and we also want to have a university structure that is more active in uh, using uh, our partners' resources as well. In Estonia as well as uh, abroad. And the collaboration forms uh, would have to be meaningful so that we wouldn't have uh, 700 uh, contracts that all move in different uh, directions, but that we would have resources that focus on uh, getting uh, the uh, Blue Economy Competence Center in Kurasara up and running. Uh, this in turn means that we don't start with one or two uh, specific projects, but in cooperation with our researchers, we want to see a strategic cooperation. So we bring in grants, we um, increase our capacity of uh, learning, and uh, we don't want a situation where we have to think about whether we have the resources to uh, follow through the activities that we've started. As we saw in the previous presentation, there were millions and billions of euros uh, available, and I believe that if we grabbed a share of it, then we uh, could talk about uh, many more professors working in, in college, instead of seven, maybe 27. And this is what we try to achieve through various uh, sources of financing. Here I have split up the sources in, 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 in two parts, so uh, internal or um, uh, national and external or foreign funding. And actually we have done well, but uh, done well compared to whom? That's the question. Because in the previous presentation we could see that the Estonian dot on the slide was quite small under the Horizon program, and this is definitely something that we would like to see growing, and we don't want to be just the biggest in, in the Baltic states, but also comparable to the rest of Europe. So currently we submit, as an average, about 300 new project applications per year. We have about 365 projects, uh, ongoing projects, like a new project would start every day um, in a year. Uh, and the portfolio 
uh, is worth about 125 uh, million euros. But obviously, no project uh, starts and ends uh, within a calendar year, so it's um, across uh, many years. But this is something that we would like to work together on with Kurasara College and their partners, and not only in terms of the budget, but also in order to achieve the strategy or fulfill the strategy of uh, the college. And the next speaker uh, will be remotely um, joining us from Tallinn, and uh, she will talk about. Uh, he will talk about uh, how to be successful in preparing these projects and applying for funds. And this is where I would like to finish my talk uh, by saying that the university, with its networks and collaboration projects and international contacts, is just a phone call away. You don't, um, in order to start a project, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have a couple of uh, wheels available, and uh, some of them run quite uh, fast. And the success, success stories that we have have um, given us an advantage in comparison with other uh, Central and Eastern European universities. So the study quality is, um, is higher, and uh, as a proof, you can see that we are um, in Eurotech, which, which is a very prestigious um, alliance indeed. But now I think that's all for me, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Reyo. I think that uh, that was a very good message to the companies uh, who are present here. And in the college, as you said, uh, we also have the same principle that setting up a corporation is always just the phone call away. And the first thing you have to do is to talk about your idea. And Taltec and Kurasara College are ready to take it all forward. And Reyo already made an introduction uh, to seem Lanelite, and he will be speaking remotely from the University of. Technology. Here you are. Hello, Siim. Uh, yeah, uh, so the head of um, uh, project writing team at uh, the University of Technology. And I think your key message is that everything is very um, easily done. Uh, how to prepare a project, how to bring it home, and how to fulfill the objectives of the project. So the floor is yours. Thank you. It was nice listening to Rea right now. In the beginning, I thought all of this was very complicated as well. Luckily, uh, my life actually became very easy because the ex I have a clear expectation, and that is for me to make things easier for you. So applying for European funds, it's very simple. It's down to very simple things. Don't overthink it. First of all, a few words about my own background. Education-wise, I am a professional bureaucrat, public um, administration Tartu University. I have been working on municipality projects for seven years, or I have worked for a municipality for seven years, and for the last 15 years I have been advising R&D projects in a consultation bureau as a freelancer, and for the last four years uh, I have been inside a university. So this world writing applications is familiar to me. And right away, I hope that you all are relieved by the fact or, or that you are what is of the biggest value for me in my job. 
the people with whom and for whom we put together the projects. This is not a boring job, coming to, of, to the office in the morning and just writing and writing and writing up papers. Um, it's really enjoyable to see you with sparkling eyes, knowing what you want, knowing where you want to go and being able to help you with this. So very briefly, why do projects get grants at all? If we we'll look at it from the lens of the EU or public funding in general, uh, projects are supported in order to support um, implementation of different policies, for example, EU energy objectives, supporting EU economy through innovation. When we innovate, uh, we um, fulfill our energy objectives and for that companies need to be able to go through with the innovation and the solutions need to be available in the market, they need to be uh, reasonably priced and so on. And this is one of the reasons why EU wants to finance innovation in SMEs. So um, research and development organizations uh, or companies may not have free funds accessible easily in order to innovate. That is the main reason why we get grants. How or through what do we get grants? Uh, the list is actually very short. What are the tools for supporting different R&D projects? First of all, EU Horizon program. It has three pillars. In Estonia, uh, we have structural funds. Uh, and there's a certain international component to this and a number of smaller and bigger different programs. But this is not the focus of my talk today. And this is not what makes your life easier either because you all know uh, already. Um, the focus of Teltec is applying for European Horizon program. This includes both research and innovation actions as well as innovation actions as well as coordination and support actions, uh, increasing capacity as well as uh, actions uh, intended at companies, ESC accelerator. There are different funding rates for national measures. They are different, but whatever measure we are talking about, we should start out by taking a journey together. To take the journey together, we uh, need to know what uh, the other half wants. The f universities are looking for companies uh, who could um, who we could help. Well, we do this on a daily basis. But if you as organizations, uh, companies or public organizations have a challenge that you want solved, this is a good point of departure. So a description of your problem, essentially. What is the problem? And the problem that you don't have a solution to. Does it have to do with material technology, other technology, IT? There is one difference here. 
that uh, makes the university stand apart from engineering bureaus or other companies in the market. Researchers want to focus on what is new, on something that cannot be bought in the market. This takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And the result is not predictable. We might get hypotheses, we might get informed expectations, but when it comes to research and development, the final output might be a little bit different than what you expected. This is something that needs to be taken into account. But the point of departure is that we need to know what your problem is. Um, I hope you will be, uh, you will get um, uh, a presentation with slides uh, later as well. But moving on from here, if you know what your problem is and you want universities' help to solve it, then uh, the easiest uh, way to approach us is to find the researchers who are active in this field, in the school. I just got a message uh, that I wasn't sharing my screen and you are not seeing my slides. Thank you for reminding me. I have kept showing slides and uh, now I got the message you, that you are not seeing them. Just a second, please. Are you seeing the slides now? Is, is it better? Yeah. If you have a problem, let me know right away. <laughs> It's much easier to follow. Okay, so this is what I have been speaking about. It's on the slides. I will not repeat all of this. So coming back to where I uh, start, where, where I stopped. If you can define the field of studies or if you know researchers active in the field, uh, you can, for example, use the Estonian Research Information System um, who has published anything on this topic. Then you can contact the researchers uh, directly. If you don't know whom to contact, you either don't have their contact data or you don't know which unit or person to turn to, please contact our um, business department, email address partner at taltech.ee and then it will be our task to find you a competent partner. And once you have found a scientific partner, research partner, with whom you already have an existing cooperation, with whom you have spoken, then um, in the case of research projects, our research department, in the case of uh, applied projects, our uh, business department uh, are willing to are available to look for financing and are available to help you with the application. Hmm. Because this will help us with our task, researching. You are interested in a result, we are interested in research or knowledge. When it comes to public money, then there are a lot of questions conditions attached and one of perhaps the more negative aspects is that even once we have found a good financing source um, 
application to financing will take three to 12 months. Uh, in addition, the time to put together the application and once the application uh, has been submitted, uh, evaluation will take three months, uh, horizon projects five months, and then after that, um, even more time so you can You can generally assume that it will take about a year from a mature idea to actually being able to start the project. Public money comes with a time limitations, and for an active enterprise, this might may be quite annoying. But then again, if you can think ahead, it will be very useful. And it is not only the time that is involved. If you have taken a year or even longer to prepare a project, it doesn't pay to do it for a hundred thousand euro. It just, you know, cover the preparation costs. So the reasonable budget starts from half a million and goes up to perhaps um, fifteen million. So big ideas, longer time frame, bigger money. That's what universities are good for. And then there are some key questions that we ask from you. What do you want? What is, what is the substantive value of what you want to do? What is your problem? that we need to sh need to solve we want to see the expected output output we want to see the path towards it a lot of it can be formulated in cooperation S so who we are look who are we looking for when we look for partners from our point of view if we are talking about european projects then very often very rarely can the projects be single applicant, one or two parties. Most of our projects are consortium based. And in this case, it can be um, useful if you can tell us what are the missing competences in the project. We can help to find them. As was mentioned before, we are members of a number of networks. We have more than 300 projects, more than 360 projects uh, at work at any time. If we have already one partner in the project, this means more than 700 organizations that we are working for. And this means that uh, these people are virtually one phone call away when it comes to your project. And uh, another thing that we are asking about is an estimated cost as I mentioned, asking for 50,000 or 100,000 euros in cooperation with the university might not be that reasonable because the, the preparation time that has to be put in there already covers the project. So the project should be a bit larger. And then we ask for its expected impact. What or how uh, and who will be using the out? of the project in the future. Will it be useful for only the company? Uh, will it be available for the wider public? Will it be a paid service? So is there a business plan involved? So we're talking about billions, millions, hundreds of thousands of Europe, euros. And actually, you only have seven questions here that you need to answer. Nothing difficult.
And that's how we should approach this. Um, come find us, put down your problem on paper. We'll try to identify the answers to those seven questions. We'll find a financing source together. We'll help you find partners. And I think now I'm two minutes over time. So thank you on my behalf. Thank you, Seem, for sticking to the clock as well. An applause here. I think that was encouraging enough. And college will follow on this journey. We uh, can confirm to you, the companies and the community, that we are here for you and uh, can help you. Um, as a moderator, I now uh, take the liberty of changing the agenda because Mick Tuisk has to leave and Katarina has to. Uh, Mick Tuisk has to leave, so can we please ask him to speak before uh, Ms. Wieck? Uh, Mick, as the municipality mayor, is one of the pillars for the college because without support from the municipality, the college has no future. And I will give you the floor. And then after that, I will give floor to the Ministry of Environment, but Mick, Mick first. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So on my behalf, uh, well, I already heard that you had a fascinating day. Uh, the current Minister for Environment, the previous municipal mayor, um, already took the floor in the morning. But we, uh, the, the town of Kurasare, can say that indeed Kurasare College is very important to us. We will continue to support them, not only financially, but also with know-how and other resources that we have to offer. Uh, for us, it's important to have a good education on the island so that our youth could study here, but also for the reason of attracting young people from um, other parts of Estonia. And we don't only talk about education, but also R&D and innovation in a wider context. And one of the reasons why we want the college to be here is that we also want to work on innovation uh, let's say in regard of wind farms, uh, wind farm engineers, electrical engineers, this is something that we would like to see in Kurasara College. Uh, and also uh, the blue economy, ma maritime economy, fishing, seafaring, this is what we need. And this is what we expect from Kurasara College. And also one of the reasons why uh, we have and will continue to support the college. And I do hope that I will become the municipal mayor at the end of the month so I can give you the promise that we continue our support and that we uh, will extend and we already have extended the contracts with Taltec. So if you uh, get funding, uh, it's uh, very nice if you bring it to Sarema and we give you all we can. Thank you and good luck. That was short and quick, uh, but now I will give the floor to uh, Katarina Wieck. Madis already said that a member of the government, but uh, she's not a member of the government. She's uh, from the ministry. And Katarina, uh, we would like to hear from you whether the college is moving in the right direction, as we hope it is. Now the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. Uh, by way of introduction, I would um, tell you a few words about my background. I'm a maritime ecologist by education, which means that blue economy is not only something that I work with uh, in my professional life, but I've also done research, I've been a research advisor, and now I'm, I'm an advisor on maritime uh, policy in the ministry. So these topics are very close to my heart. To start with, even though we've touched upon this before today, uh, I would like to bring us back to the um, 
or take us back to the definition of blue economy. It's a new definition that uh, uh, was um, taken into use in the Sustainable Development Conference in uh, Rio de Janeiro in 2010. And even though a blue economy has become a buzzword, um, it's still true that various organizations have given a different meaning to this term. In the most narrow sense, blue economy means that um, this, um, it means sustainable development of uh, maritime economy. Uh, for example, there's a definition that says <clears throat> that blue economy is a sustainable use of ocean resources and economic growth so that the ecosystem and health of the oceans would be preserved. So in other words, it means that the blue economy is a sub-concept of green economy. Um, another definition says that blue economy um, means or it contains all uh, maritime sectors, whether they are sustainable or not. And in the widest meaning, blue economy is any kind of economic activity and making them more environmentally um, sustainable uh, in regards of oceans and waters or seas. Therefore, uh, it's important for us also to keep in mind that blue economy has various definitions and many aspects should be taken into account. Next, uh, the blue economy should make, should enable to benefit from uh, the seas and coastal areas, but at the same time, it uh, should allow these areas and um, and seas to uh, recover and be restored. Uh, it should also help us achieve climate neutrality, uh, bio preserve biodiversity, and to apply circular economy principles. It's also important to have very good status of the uh, waters, uh, biodiversity, which unfortunately currently is um, on the downfall, and uh, there are many uh, pressure factors. Um, due to human activities, both on land and sea. And the factors that are related to uh, sea obviously have, they all have a negative impact on uh, maritime environment. As, as I said already, blue economy has various components and traditional uh, components such as seafaring, coastal tourism and others uh, have an impact but also other new emerging impacts are there, such as uh, biotechnologies, uh, wind farming, etc. So when we do all these activities, we have to consider uh, the pressure it puts on the uh, maritime environment, and we have to keep an eye on not making the um, maritime environment worse, but rather improving it. If we look at these factors, these pressure factors, uh, if we look at them individually, they might not have such a big impact, but we do have a cumulative uh, impact. And that also includes um, invasive species, uh, acidification, waste, and so on. Uh, these all have a negative impact on, on sea and uh, uh, maritime environment. We might ask, what's the difference? Why is it important that uh, the biodiversity is not as rich as it used to be, but actually it has an impact on people living in the coastal areas, uh, the water temperature might change due to that, uh, the sea levels might change, uh, acidification, um, there could be erosion, uh, the sea level could rise. And this is why it's important that the blue economy activities would be sustainable. So what does it mean to have sustainable activities? The European Commission suggests 
that we could update the standards that are valid for uh, sea vessels and um, taking them in, um, using them in a more circular manner. 30% uh, of the maritime areas in the European Union could be uh, protected. Uh, it should be uh, preserved, but also the coastal areas should be protected, protected from erosion, uh, floods, uh, and that would help us benefit from tourism and coastal economy and economic activities there. But also innovation, more innovational sectors are um, important. Uh, for example, ocean energy production, uh, bioeconomy uh, of the waters, uh, biotech. And it would help us make the more traditional sectors, such as ports and seafaring, more environmentally friendly. Uh, but there are also other sectors, such as renewable energy, for example, or biotech, that are already more innovative and sustainable. Uh, therefore, it's important to invest into R&D and innovation. And as mentioned before, the European Commission has set up a new framework program, European Horizon, for these uh, purposes. Tito already showed us that there are many partnerships. Um, Estonia is not able to participate in everything, but we are in involved in the Blue Economy partnerships. And it shows us that uh, we consider it very important. Um, the Ministry of Environment is the lead partner, but also the Ministry of Rural Affairs. Uh, uh, is a partner and we support Estonia researchers uh, financially so that they could take part in public uh, competitions. The Com European Commission provides 150 million euros and the partnership lasts for six years. And also the Ministry of Environment only takes part in three partnerships, so biodiversity, chemical safety and blue economy which shows that we regard blue economy as a very important topic. At the European Union level, uh, there we have five missions and four out of them are related to the environment and they are all horizontal themes, so soil, uh, blue economy, uh, healthy oceans, so it shows that also on an international scale, the blue economy is uh, uh, considered uh, very important. The Ministry of Education and Research is the coordinator of the mission, and the objective is to make blue economy climate neutral and to restore um, the oceans. But what's going on in Estonia? One of the major or acute topics that we see is that the Estonian approach to blue economy is not sustainable yet. It focuses on uh, vessels, ports, seafaring, uh, maritime transport, and it's very fragmented. Uh, divided between various institutions, like the minister said in the morning, we have the Ministry of Finances, we have the Ministry of Economics, uh, Environment, uh, there is the uh, Office of um, uh, Natural Heritage that has certain uh, part to play, um, the Environmental Agency, so all the topics under the blue economy uh, umbrella are very fragmented between various institutions and we don't have a central coordinator that would link all these activities and would also regard these activities from the viewpoint of being sustainable. At the same time, it's not clear what the sustainable means, how to be sustainable, and for 
these purposes, in order to find answers to that, that we have put together a working group that um, expects all the um, relevant partners to uh, chip in. And we would like to map the current situation to find out who is doing what and, and why and wh where we could see the uh, room for development. Uh, the Center for Environmental Investments would be one of the partners that could take uh, the lead. And I believe that this is a very good, this would be a very good first step for the development of blue economy in Estonia. And in summary, I would say that a sustainable blue economy, in our view, means that we can and should use uh, C for economic purposes, but it shouldn't worsen the situation uh, of the sea. R&D and innovation uh, all have a huge role to play in making uh, the blue economy more sustainable. We are aware of the gaps that exist and we will be working on them. And that would be all from me. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that this was the order of uh, speeches. It's, it was good to hear that we have the support from the local uh, municipality and a comment is that actually uh, Mick, the previous speaker, will not just become uh, the municipal mayor. Actually, he already has has the votes uh, to, to do it. He has been a deputy mayor uh, before, so he knows the, uh, the matters at, at hand. But why I said that I was um, happy to see, see the speeches in that order was that we have the municipal support, but now we also heard that the ministry is working. I wouldn't say that they are putting together a white book on on um, um, on blue economy, but um, actually since we share the same concerns and uh, uh, we are uh, expecting and waiting for collaboration offers. And as we now heard, we are in the beginning of the journey as a college and the ministry is also uh, in the beginning of a, of a journey. So um, whether these uh, paths uh, will be joined, we will see in the, in the future. But our next speaker has the honor of um, summing up the day. So, good afternoon on my behalf to everyone as well. I will not show you 30 slides, I only have two. I understand everybody is a bit tired already. What um, I really feel, Bilo, I think, said something that I wanted to say. We do seem to have the supply and the demand. And I think we also have the will. Uh, today we are, we have actually managed to do a full tour de table in the sense that we have heard from the state, we have heard from the municipality. I know that Sarema has a very strong community of companies and it is good that we have college here as well. What we need to do now is to bring together everything. We need to have the will, we need to have the courage. We know that there is financing. We know how to access this financing. We have a very clear understanding of what we need to do to get it. Both Siem and Reo covered this. Deed mentioned this. And we have supported the college um, from the university side uh, with our, let's say, continental uh, 
uh, departments, from the research uh, side, from the business uh, department side. Companies don't need to know how this works inside the university. What you need to know is to whom to turn to here in Kurasara, and after that we will get the processes going inside the university. So I will now show you one slide. Can I take the microphone off the stand? Is that possible? I will give you the hand microphone, says the moderator. This slide on the left side describes the standard solutions and on the right side you see tailor-made solutions. University is like a big mothership with 80 programs, 120 research groups, 120 chairs with professors and all those three or four hundred research projects and a lot of collaboration. All of this is happening in this gray column. And uh, within the society, the university has the classical role of contributing towards the economy by way of taxes, income, alumni, etc. We, we are growing next generations of academics, we are growing next generations of staff for companies. But when we move to the right, here we have tailor-made solutions from the point of view of a company. All those things that the university is doing on a regular basis in a standard way, we can, we can negotiate them based on the specific needs of a specific company. And by a company, I also mean a municipality or a public organization. We can find a tailor-made solution uh, to build up a specific chair. We can create elective uh, subjects. We can create select study programs for a company that needs its future staff planned. Of course, we can launch specific projects based on the program problem that a company or a municipality or the state has to solve from expert knowledge to specific prototypes or building uh, of a factory. Um, full package solutions uh, may include solutions on legislation, solutions on new business models, solutions on uh, feasibility or cost-profit analysis. A company is not alone here. We can involve different competences from different institutes across the continent. And this is what different presenters actually said here. When the college says that it has seven blue economy related research areas, uh, which I think clicked very well with the view of the state. And if companies see a place for themselves under one or a few of those areas, all kinds of cooperation activities can be launched in this blue column. So if you see a point for collaboration, I hope you can spot something on this slide. And finally, a very simple brief for you. As Sim said, if you cannot say, um, if you don't know anything or, uh, more specific, send an email to partner at Taltec. Um, and they will find you a partner inside the university. If you know a researcher who you want to collaborate with, then you can 
either contact them directly, you can contact them through the business department. And on this island, the gatekeeper is Villo. You know, um, the island is separate from the continent and everybody knows everybody. So Villo is somebody who can always find support on the continent and support through him everything that we can do here on the basis of the college. Coming back to the financing, there's a myth that I need to bust. Uh, Rayo showed us large numbers here. The truth is that, sadly, researchers don't sit in the university meditating and waiting for something interesting to come up. As the rector said, every researcher has to bring their own uh, financing home on a competitive basis. That is why we are speaking a lot about money today. But if you have a real problem, if you have real interest or motivation, regardless of whether you're a company or a public organization, then money is available. We can find a way to bring this money home. But this will and courage to get involved is the first prerequisite here. So I uh, wish you good will and motivation. And I believe that the director of Kurasara uh, College, as well as the team of the college, are really, really motivated to get this all going. And Vilu, I will now hand the floor back to you to wrap up. Once again, an applause is merited. Thank you, everyone. I now I have this. Uh, role, double role as Minister Gallas had in creating this college. He entered as a, as a mayor and exited as a minister. I entered as a moderator and exited as the uh, company contact person. But um, to wrap up, uh, thank you everyone who has come here today. I know there are many people from our own organization and Kaya, I think you summed it up very well. We have the will, we can always add some faith, and the world is full of opportunities. So thank you, everyone. And this will certainly not be the last event. Uh, some of the speakers already said that they wanted to come back. And uh, both the vision of uh, ministry of what is going to happen, uh, what we heard from Brussels, the blue economy is a huge topic. We as a humanity are late. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Let's start this work. Let's start innovating. You're all welcome back to uh, college events. And now, uh, as I mentioned before, you're all welcome to uh, the first floor upstairs. You will be treated to a light lunch. Thank you. And thank you, Dule Koda. Uh, thank you to the technical equipment. Some people were here for, at 4 a.m. to set all of this up. Thank you. It worked very well. Thank you for receiving us.